Lucifer Means Lightbringer presents The Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire Moons of Ice and Fire Part 5 R plus L equals J A Recipe for Ice Dragons Hey there, friends, patrons, and fellow mythical astronomers. It's your starry host, Lucifer Means Lightbringer. And I'm here with a very special podcast today. It's the R plus L equals J episode. It's quite fitting that the fandom has come to refer to John's secret parentage with an equation, what might also be called a formula or even a recipe, because John's conception and birth is indeed symbolic of a formula with greater importance for the story. It's the recipe for making ice dragons. What do I mean by that? Well, we're going to talk about that today, of course, but in short, the ice dragons I'm referring to are the others, and the last hero. Or more specifically, I should say that the ice dragons we're concerned with are the others and the new last hero figure known as Jon Snow, the frozen version of Azor High Reborn. Jon is a symbolic ice dragon by virtue of his parents' symbolism. Rhaegar is a black dragon figure, and he gives his seed to Lyanna Stark of the Blue Winter Rose. Similarly, the others are created when Night's King gives his seed to the moon-pale, ice-cold Night's Queen. If Night's King was a blood-of-the-dragon person, as I am proposing, then his creating the others with Night's Queen expresses the same basic pattern as R plus L equals J. A black dragon figure has his fiery seed frozen in the cold womb of an ice queen, with Lyanna being a symbolic ice queen and Night's Queen being a literal one. This creates a parallel between John and the others, and in the last episode, The Long Night Was His to Rule, we saw that John does seem to share some amount of symbolism with the others, such as his being called Lord Snow, his dreaming of being armored in ice, and then there was that funny line where the other, like, wildlings were crossing through the wall, and it said... Others smiled at him like long-lost kin. This seems a perplexing mystery at first, but by the end of this episode, I think we're going to understand it pretty well. So in terms of mythical astronomy archetypes, R plus L equals J translates to Dark Solar King, Rhaegar, plus Icy Moon Queen, Lyanna, equals Ice Dragon Children, John. That's our recipe, and as with all major symbolic patterns in A Song of Ice and Fire, it has a celestial companion, a heavenly mirroring of the archetypal drama that takes place on the ground. That's what mythical astronomy as a concept is all about, after all. Now, you all know what the dark solar king represents by now. I think I've repeated it enough times. It's the darkened sun of the long night. The sun is darkened first by the fire moon moving into the god's eye eclipse position, wandering too close to the sun, as it says in the Carthian legend, and then by the dust and debris from the fire moon's explosion, and that would be the waves of night symbolism. In both cases, it's the combination of the sun and the fire moon which creates the dark sun. This is basically like saying that Azor Ahai becomes a dark lord after killing his wife Nissa Nissa. Killing the moon maiden is an evil act, and it transforms the solar king. That's the idea. So, up in the sky, the fire moon appears to combine with the sun, creating the god's eye eclipse symbol, then explodes in meteor dragon childbirth to create the dark sun symbol. These black fire moon meteors can now be seen as the dark solar king's sword or his seed, as I mentioned last time. And in a two-moon system, it's pretty much inevitable that if one moon exploded, in whole or in part, some of that shrapnel would strike the other moon, which would be the ice moon in this case. So when one of those dark solar king star seeds impregnates the nearby ice moon, that is the ice dragon recipe in action, the celestial version of RLJ. It's the dark solar king, think Rhaegar or Night's King, giving his star seed to the icy moon queen, who is like Night's queen or Lyanna. In other words, and I just want to make this crystal clear, what I'm proposing is that this one celestial chain reaction scenario mirrors both the conception of John and the creation of the others. Whether in the sky or on the ground, it's the same pattern. A knight-associated black dragon figure, the dark solar king, gives his seed to an icy moon figure. This creates two kinds of ice dragon children. The black dragon meteor that strikes the ice moon and becomes trapped in the ice, 
and the pieces of ice moon that would have been chipped off by the impact. The black dragon meteor locked in the ice moon would represent John, who is in so many ways depicted as a black dragon or crow lodged in ice and snow. Just to scratch the surface, you may recall the line from Bran's coma dream about John, the one that comes just before Bran sets eyes on that terrifying heart of winter and its dawn lights of the north. And the line was, He saw the wall shining like blue crystal, and his bastard brother John sleeping alone in a cold bed, his skin growing pale and hard as the memory of all warmth fled from him. Don't worry, we'll be expanding on this in detail later today. Now as for the others... They would symbolize the pieces of the ice moon that would have been chipped off by the impact. Ice moon meteor dragons, in other words. Hence the cold, blue, burning star eyes of the others, I believe, which signify their status as cold, falling star people. As I set out in the very first Moons of Ice and Fire episode, the others parallel the dragons as symbols of falling stars of the moon meteor variety, with the dragons, quote, coming from the moon, according to legend, and the others coming from a moon-pale, icy woman. The others come from this ice moon queen only when Night's King gives her his dragon seed, mimicking the celestial sequence that has the ice moon meteors coming from the ice moon when it's struck by a black meteor. We can also see that this hypothetical celestial sequence matches the myths about the others coming for the first time during the long night. The fire moon explosion begins the long night, and as an immediate consequence... The ice moon is struck and impregnated, yielding up some icy moon meteors. Those icy moon meteors are analogous to the others, and they would have indeed come shortly after the fall of the long night, as the others did. And although it's not really the topic of today's episode, I will quickly point out that according to my theory, one of those ice moon meteors would have been the pale stone from which dawn was made. Now sometimes, I have to say, I feel like drawing diagrams for this stuff. And that's something that people ask for sometimes. But Martin has his own ways of doing this. He describes an eclipse by telling us that the moon wandered too close to the sun. Or he has Joran draw pictures in the dirt with a stick. Or he uses house sigils, like that of House Pryor, which shows a black moon sliding into eclipse position. Or Euron's crow's eye sigil, which looks a lot like my own eclipse eye logo. He also uses family trees to create diagrams, and that's something we'll be considering today. But the very best diagrams of what seems to be happening in space come from the dragon-on-dragon battles. There's one in particular involving Vagar, the symbolic ice dragon, which acts as a perfect visual depiction of this whole dragon-locked-in-ice concept. And I think it will seem less abstract and esoteric if we start with a diagram, as it were, as a prelude to RLJ. As strange as it sounds... This dragon battle will essentially be a dramatization of John's conception. I want you to keep that in mind. Of course, it will be simultaneously showing us the fire moon meteor lodging on the ice moon, because that's how this works. As above, so below. Now, I have to tell you, I have a very special treat today. A special guest reader. Let me welcome to the podcast Gemma of the Secrets of the Citadel YouTube channel. I've been looking to feature a couple of friends in the community as guest readers, and Gemma was able to step in on short notice due to my bad planning around the holidays and help me get this podcast out. I went from not quite knowing what to do to having a YouTube celebrity spice up my podcast and make it extra special. I'm sure she's rolling her eyes at the YouTube celebrity thing, but she really does do great work, which you may already be familiar with. So check out Secrets of the Citadel on YouTube. She just did one speculating on the current whereabouts of the original Lightbringer sword of Azor Ahai, a topic near and dear to my heart, and to yours as well, I trust. Thanks, as always, to George R. R. Martin for inviting us into his world of ice and fire, and thanks, as always, to John Walsh for our theme music, and you can check out his music on YouTube at John Walsh Guitar. A heartfelt thanks goes to our Patreon sponsors, of course, and that's heartfelt in a you-keep-the-lights-on kind of way, so cheers. And a very special extra thank you to three stalwart patrons who have allowed me to spill their blood in front of the heart tree with a sickle-shaped blade in order to be raised as green zombies and our first three members of the mythical astronomy Long Night's Watch. Long Night is coming, and we need twelve brave souls to volunteer. See our Patreon page for more details. 
Or perhaps you can't stand those with hot blood in their veins, or those green zombie abominations in the Night's Watch, and you'd prefer to be a white walker of the woods, riding down on the winds of winter to extinguish all life. So annoying, that life. Again, details on our Patreon page, which you can find a link to at lucifermeanslightbringer.com. That's also where you can find the matching text to this podcast, as usual. And also, as usual, we'll be having a follow-up live stream Q&A for this episode, not this upcoming Saturday, January the 13th, but rather the 20th of January, and that will be at our usual time, 3.30 Eastern. Each one of these live streams has been a little bit more fun and progressively run a little bit smoother, so if you haven't checked one out already, please come on down to the Lucifer Means Lightbringer YouTube channel, and I hope to see you there. All right, now to a fictional story of an uncle and a nephew using dragons to kill each other over a lake. Crouching Damon, Flying Dragon. This section is dedicated to our first three patrons to volunteer their lives to the Long Night's Watch. Sharon Ice Eyes, Dread Ferryman of the North, Wielder of the Staff of the Gods, Sir Cletus Ironwood Reborn of the Never Lazy Eye, Wrestler of Bulls, and Lady Jane of House Celtigar, Emerald of the Evening, and Captain of the Dreadship Eclipse Wind. The dragon-on-dragon fight that takes place over the God's Eye Lake between Daemon Targaryen riding Caraxes the Bloodworm and Aemon One-Eye Targaryen riding Vagar is one of my very favorite pieces of mythical astronomy in the entire series. It's really tremendous because the God's Eye concept is spelled out with a sky-ground parallel. The lake correlates to the sun and the Isle of Faces to the Fire Moon, and that's highlighted in the middle of the fight when the Fire Moon dragon blocks the sun and makes an eclipse, with the end of the fight giving us both dragons falling to the God's Eye Lake, bringing the above and below versions of the metaphor smashing together. It's pretty great, and I've been saving it for a special occasion, and it seems that the RLJ episode is that occasion. As you'll recall, when Vagar, the hoary old bitch dragon, is ridden by Aemond One-Eye with his blue star sapphire eye, they combine to make the ice dragon symbol, and thus the ice moon symbol, particularly since Vagar is referred to as a she-dragon. In the last Vagar dragon battle, we had a red dragon, Melis the Red Queen, playing the fire moon role, and in this fight we have another red dragon, Caraxes the Bloodworm, who I think also is representing the fire moon. More specifically, Caraxes and Daemon are playing the role of a fiery dragon meteor coming from the fire moon explosion, a star seed of the dark sun, in other words. Daemon Targaryen and his black armor brings the black, while the dragon is red with black horns and accents. Most importantly, Daemon wields Dark Sister, a smoke-dark Valyrian steel sword. At the beginning of the fight, we're going to see Caraxes move into an eclipse alignment and then dive bomb from the direction of the sun, depicting the transformation of the fire moon into a fire moon meteor, or said another way, into a dark star seed coming from the dark sun. Damon himself is pretty easy to identify as an evil Azor High type. Just as Night's King was a usurper king whose brother was said to be the Star King of Winter, Damon declared himself the King of the Narrow Sea when he quarreled with his brother, the rightful King Viserys I, thereby setting himself up as a kind of rival or usurper king. Fantastically, Damon made his seat on Bloodstone Island in the Stepstones, giving him a great tie to the Bloodstone Emperor who is kind of the original usurping Dark Solar King. Damon also shares his name with his grandson, Damon Blackfire, who bore the sword Blackfire and loved it so much that he named his house after it, thus conferring even more Dark Solar King slash Black Dragon symbolism onto Damon. So we have an evil Azor High figure in Damon riding a Fire Moon Dragon, Caraxes. And of course, they are coming for Vagar, our Ice Moon symbol. I've quoted this scene before, but with the ice moon ideas in mind, it takes on new meaning and deserves another look. Prince Damon took Caraxes up swiftly, lashing him with a steel-tipped whip until they drew a bank of clouds. Vagar, older and much the larger, was also slower, made ponderous by her very size and ascended more gradually in ever-widening circles 
that took her and her rider out over the waters of the god's eye. The hour was late, the sun was close to setting, and the lake was calm, its surface glimmering like a sheet of beaten copper. Up and up she soared, searching for Caraxes as Illy's rivers watched from atop King Spire Tower in Harrenhal below. The attack came sudden as a thunderbolt. Caraxes dove down upon Vega with a piercing shriek that was heard a dozen miles away, cloaked by the glare of the setting sun on Prince Amon's blind side. The blood worm slammed into the older dragon with terrible force. Their roars echoed across the god's eye as the two grappled and tore at one another, dark against the blood-red sky. So bright did their flames burn that fisher folk below feared the clouds themselves had caught fire. Locked together, the dragons tumbled towards the lake. The blood worm's jaws closed about Vagar's neck, her black teeth sinking deep into the flesh of the larger dragon. Even as Vagar's claws raked her belly open and Vagar's own teeth ripped away a wing, Caraxes bit deeper, worrying at the wound as the lake rushed up below them with terrible speed. What's happening here is that Caraxes and Damon first create the God's Eye Eclipse alignment by attacking with the setting sun at their back, just as the moon wandered too close to the sun before exploding in fiery dragon meteor childbirth. As if to reflect that alignment, the God's Eye Lake, which is analogous to the sun in the God's Eye Eclipse alignment, shines like beaten copper, which is a solar symbol. Think of Drogo's face like a copper mask, for example. Damon and Caraxes' red and black dive bomb attack mimics a fire moon meteor flying from the eclipse alignment, and it lands in the ice moon symbol, Vagar, ridden by Aemond One-Eye. The idea of a black meteor embedding in the ice is implied by the blood worms slamming into Vagar with terrible force, by Caraxes' black teeth sinking deep into the flesh of the white dragon, and there's one more thing. That thing I like to call the most metal thing anyone ever did in Westeros. And it was then the tales tell us that Prince Daemon Targaryen swung a leg over his saddle and leapt from one dragon to the other. In his hand was Dark Sister, the sword of Queen Visenya, as Aemon One-Eye looked up in terror, fumbling with the chains that bound him to his saddle, Damon ripped off his nephew's helm and drove the sword down into his blind eye, so hard the point came out the back of the young prince's throat. Half a heartbeat later, the dragon struck the lake, sending up a gout of water so high that it was said to have been as tall as King Spire Tower. Neither man nor dragon could have survived such an impact. The fisher folk who saw it said, nor did they. Caraxes lived long enough to crawl back onto the land, gutted with one wing torn from his body and the waters of the lake smoking about him. The blood worm found the strength to drag himself onto the lake shore, expiring beneath the walls of Harrenhal. Vagar's carcass plunged into the lake floor, the hot blood from the gaping wound in her neck, bringing the water to a boil over her last resting place. When she was found some years later, at the end of the Dance of the Dragons, Prince Amon's armoured bones remained chained to her saddle, with Dark Sister thrust hilt deep through his eye socket. Talk about a warrior who knew no fear. And talk about mythical astronomy. You couldn't ask for a better example of a black fire moon meteor, the ones that symbolize Azor High Reborn, the black dragon, than Damon in his black armor, leaping from the red dragon to the hoary white one, like Solar King Azor High skipping from one moon to the other. This is followed by a second ice moon impregnation symbol as Damon jams the blade dark sister right through the star sapphire in Aemon's blind eye. That's pretty freaking metal if anything is, and it's also detailed mythical astronomy. Valerian steel is a prime symbol of a black fire moon meteor, and since the two moons are like sisters, I think dark sister is an excellent name for a piece of the moon which was burned black. 
so that's a black dragon sword from the Dark Sister Moon, delivered to the Ice Moon with love by the Dark Solar King. Although Visenya isn't stabbed with Dark Sister, the fact that she is a Night's Queen figure who carried around Dark Sister in her day creates the same metaphor. The Ice Moon Queen carries a piece of her Dark Sister around with her. Brienne the Blue is another Icy Moon Maiden, and when she carries Oathkeeper, it's basically the same as Visenya carrying Dark Sister. And who gave Oathkeeper to Brienne? A solar lion, Jamie Lannister. Or we might say it came from Tywin by way of Jamie. Now, returning to the dragon fight at the God's Eye, I think the fact that Aemond One-Eye's corpse was found years later at the bottom of the lake, still chained to Vagar, with Dark Sister still lodged in his skull, is an important clue. It speaks of this black moon meteor still being stuck in the ice moon, as I believe it may still be in the current story. Now, it's funny to think about this, but if we compare this fight between the fire and ice moon dragons to the symbolism of Euron's eyes as the two moons, in the symbolic sense, it's basically equivalent to Euron's blood eye attacking his smiling eye. Just bear with me for a second. The black and red blood eye slash crow's eye is equivalent to Damon riding Caraxes, attacking from the solar eclipse position. That's the god's eye, after all. While Euron's blue smiling eye would correlate to Aemond one eye riding Vagar, impregnated in violent fashion by the black moon meteor symbols Damon and Dark Sister. Now, I don't expect Euron to go cross-eyed or anything, but I find that making these comparisons helps to keep all the symbolism straight in your mind. And sometimes it leads to funny ideas, like one of Euron's eyes attacking the other. As I mentioned at the top, Damon stabbing Aemond in the eye with that sword is also equivalent to Knight's King giving his seed and soul to Knight's Queen, or to Rhaegar impregnating Lyanna. Be it dragon sword or dragon seed, we're seeing the black dragon fire moon meteor being planted in an ice moon symbol. As ever, sex and sword play, the dual metaphor. Damon, like Knight's King, was an evil Azor High red dragon slash black armor type, and when he jams Dark Sister into the blue star eye, he's showing us Knight's King giving his dragon seed to an icy moon symbol, and yes, as odd as it sounds, He's also showing us Rhaegar putting little baby John's sperm in Lyanna's womb. Lyanna did die giving birth, after all, and Rhaegar also dies around the same time, just as everyone dies here in this dragon fight. Of course, that's how most dragon fights usually end. Spoiler alert. Accordingly, this fight happens on the same day as the storming of the dragon pit, which is perhaps the most fantastic fire moon death metaphor outside of Danny's alchemical wedding. On the 22nd day of the fifth moon of the year, 130 AC, Amon One-Eye and Daemon Targaryen entered their last battle. On that same day, chaos and death seized King's Landing. Queen Rhaenyra had imprisoned Lord Corlys for helping his grandson, Sir Adam Valerian, escape arrest. And when he was accused of treason, some of the sea snakes' sworn swords joined the riotous mob in Cobbler's Square, and some scaled the walls to try to free the sea snake, only to be hanged when they were caught. Queen Helena then fell to her death impaled on the spikes surrounding Magor's holdfast, a suicide, some said, and others, a murder. And that night, the city burned as the shepherd's mob marched on the dragon pit, attempting to slay all the dragons within. Not only do we get the storming of the dragon pit as a fire moon death metaphor, we also get Queen Helena leaping to her death. Helena was the grieving wife of the wounded King Aegon II, who was the bright solar king in that fight, and thus Helena is a Nissa Nissa fire moon figure, and of course falling to your death works well to depict a moon falling from heaven. If you think back to Weirwood Compendium 3, Garth of the Gallows, you'll recall our discussion of Elenai, a child of the gods who came down to earth, who seems to be based on Helen of Troy, and Helena seems to fit that mold. She's coming down to earth in a violent fashion, but it's the same idea. Daenerys, our signature Fire Moon Maiden, also seems to draw influence from the Norse goddess Hel, which could be another thing referenced by Helena's name. And the reason I point out that Helena's death and the storming of the dragon pit occurred on the same day as Daemon and Aemon's dragon fight is the timing of it all. 
the ice moon should be impregnated basically right after the fire moon explodes and the long night falls. It was the same with the dragon fight that we looked at last time at Rook's Rest, where Aemond One Eye was crowned as a symbolic knight's king right after the fire moon dragon and rider were killed, and right after the solar dragon and rider were wounded and hidden. Now, to finish up with the fight above the god's eye, let's consider what happens to the combatants and their dragons. They do all die, of course, but they die in different ways. So Damon vanishes altogether, while Caraxes crawls from the lake before expiring beneath Harrenhal, which makes sense because Caraxes and Harrenhal are both fire, moon, meteor symbols. One of my favorite tinfoil theories is that Damon made it to the Isle of Faces, since that's a fire, moon symbol too, but probably he just sank under the weight of his armor and lies buried in the mud at the bottom of the lake. Now, Vagar and Aemond One-Eye definitely remained at the bottom of the lake for a while, which makes me think about how the others' voices are like the cracking of ice on a winter lake, and about how the others melt when stabbed with dragonglass. Their ice armor also reflects like the surface of a pond. Now, for those of you who also know about the symbolism of being under the sea, something that we'll get to in due time, It's also significant to find the ice moon under the sea, so to speak. I think being inside the ice moon is essentially like being submerged in a cold lake, and this is hinted at with Veramir Sixkin's death, where the line is, True death came suddenly. He felt a shock of cold, as if he had been plunged into the icy waters of a frozen lake. That line comes right before Veramir's spirit finds itself inside a one-eyed wolf, naturally. Finally, there is a nice memorial line to Vagar in The Princess and the Queen that we really should read to do the great she-dragon justice. Vagar, the greatest of the Targaryen dragons since the passing of Balerion the Black Dread, had counted 181 years upon the earth. Thus passed the last living creature from the days of Aegon's conquest as dusk and darkness swallowed Black Heron's accursed seat. It's a nice poetic line, and I also wanted to include the bit about darkness swallowing Hall at the end of all this. So, having shown you how two dragons killing each other and falling into a lake symbolizes John's conception, yes, that's what we just did, let's get to the main course and talk R plus L equals J. Dornish Moon Tragedy This section is sponsored by our new Zodiac patron, Sarah Stark of the Wolf's Blood, the Shining Hand of Faceporia, and the Earthly Avatar of Heavenly House Sagittarius. Rhaegar and Lyanna, RLJ, the Dragon and the Wolf, the Song of Ice and Fire. But don't forget about Elia. Rhaegar married her first, and they had two children together. We still don't entirely understand the rationale and motivation for Rhaegar and Lyanna's actions, but we can understand the symbolic reason for this strange love triangle. It's the same reason we get the Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya triangle, to show us one sun with two moons, moons of ice and fire. Dorn is associated with snakes and the fiery sun spears, so the symbolic children of Rhaegar and Elia might be fiery dragon snakes, A good match for our idea of the fiery moon meteors coming from the coupling of the sun and the fire moon. The sigil of House Martell tells the story. It's a sun pierced by a spear. In other words, it alludes to a dying sun, such as the sun of the long night, and to things coming from that sun, like sun spears and hammers of the waters. Also, those of you who have listened to the Weirwood Compendium series might recognize the Odin-Jesus symbolism of a pierced solar king. Everything about the Dornish symbolism describes the events of the fire moon exploding in front of the sun and the things which fell from the sky, which helps identify Elia as Rhaegar's fire moon maiden. There are several ways the Dornish symbolism places an emphasis on the dying sun which throws things at the planet, as opposed to simply the sun. We covered a lot of this in Bloodstone Compendium 4, the mountain versus the viper and the hammer of the waters, so I'll just briefly sum up here. The word sun spear implies a spear coming from the sun, 
and in the trial by combat between Sir Gregor and Oberyn Martell, we saw the Red Viper's spear point coated in poison that looked like black oil, a perfect symbol of a black moon meteor coming from the sun, since I tend to associate the black meteors and the oily black stone with one another. In Arianne's The Queen Maker chapter of A Feast for Crows, there's a great line about the two weapons of the Dornish. The arms of House Martell display the sun and spear, the Dornishman's two favoured weapons. The young dragon had once written in his boastful conquest of dawn, but of the two, the sun is more deadly. The sun is deadly because of the sun rays coming from it, which are like weapons. Later in that chapter, this theme is hit on again as it says, The sun was beating down like a fiery hammer but it did not matter with their journey at its end. Again, the emphasis is on things coming from the sun like weapons, sun spears and fiery hammers. This line about the fiery sun hammer is followed almost immediately by Marcella the Fire Moon Maiden being slashed across the face by Darkstar's sword, mimicking the crack across the face of the moon language of the Azor High legend. This sequence clues us in to the idea that the Hammer of the Waters was a fiery moon meteor, one which drank the fire of the sun and can therefore be considered a sun spear or a fiery hammer. In fact, and this is kind of the overarching point in regards to the symbolism of RLJ as a sun and two moons thing, the collection of Dornish symbolism in its entirety is basically all about the hammer of the waters being a moon meteor impact. This makes a ton of sense, since the hammer fell on the arm of Dorn, of course, And besides the Fiery Hammer line and Marcella the Wounded Moon Maiden, there are the place names by the Broken Arm of Dorne, Bloodstone, and Sunspear. It's the story of a dark solar king and his black meteor weapons, just like I've been talking about. The Bloodstone Emperor was the dark solar king, and his Sunspears were the black moon meteors. Again, this compares well to Oberyn the Red Viper as the dark solar king, wielding a spear with a blade coated in black oil. Of course, we just mentioned Daemon Targaryen, the Dark Solar King, who took Bloodstone as his seat, and Daemon symbolically became a Sunspear himself when he leapt from the back of one dragon to the other while attacking from the direction of the setting sun. The other named island in the Stepstones is Grey Gallows, which seems like a reference to Yggdrasil, Odin's Gallows Tree, as we discussed in Weirwood Compendium 3, Garth of the Gallows. The end result is that this is yet another reference to Azor High reaching for the fire of the gods, and it completes the Odin-esque symbolism of the pierced sun. As I like to mention whenever I talk about the Hammer of the Waters, one of the ships that brought Moon Maiden Marcella to Dorne was called King Robert's Hammer, yet another reference to the Hammer of the Waters, but this time it's wrapped in Robert's Storm King slash Thor Lightning Hammer symbolism. Another galley in that convoy was Lion Star, which again gives us the idea of a sun star, or in this case, a moon meteor which drank the fire of the sun. There's actually a clue about the dawn meteor falling at the same time as the black meteors that cause the long night to be found in the fact that, sailing to Dorne alongside the ships King Robert's Hammer and Lion Star, we also get one named Lady Leanna. As we're about to see, Lyanna is a signature Ice Moon Maiden, like Night's Queen, so this may be a clue about the Ice Moon Meteor falling along with the Fiery Ones. Starfall isn't far, after all, and talk of Dawn and Arthur Dane abounds in the Queenmaker chapter due to Gerald Darkstar Dane's presence. Okay, so I think that's about as briefly as I can sum up the Sunspear slash Fiery Moon Meteor slash Hammer of the Water's Ball of Symbolism, and I encourage you to check out the Mountain vs. the Viper and the Hammer of the Water's episode if you want the rest, which includes significant characters getting struck on the arm, like the Arm of Dorne, at significant times. Point being, all of that and much more points to Dorne as a great symbol for the Fire Moon and the Fiery Sun Spears it becomes, and oh yes, the name Martell means hammer, as many people have pointed out to me, since I recorded the Mountain vs. the Viper and the Hammer of the Waters episode. That's right. George named the house that lives at Sunspear Martel, and that means hammer in French. So there you go. There's also the Dorn equals Fire Moon evidence that we explored in the Visenya Draconis episode regarding the death of Rhaenys and Meraxes in Dorn at the Hellholt, a place once occupied by 
Sir Lucifer Dryland, and which sits by the Brimstone River. That's pleasing to me personally because my fake name is Lucifer and my real-world guitar pedal company is called Brimstone Audio. True story. And a complete coincidence. I swear I'm not into Satanism or anything. But more importantly, the death of Rainies and Meraxes at the Hellholt is an important symbol of the Fire Moon destruction. Namely, Rainies is Aegon's Fire Moon bride and the spearing of Meraxes through the eye calls out to the God's Eye Eclipse symbol, which represents the death of the Fire Moon and the darkening of the sun. All right, having set the stage for Elia of Dorne, let's consider what we know about the princess herself. Most of what we know concerns her tragic death and her children and false children. Thagon, Blackfire! <clears throat> oh, sorry, I got something in my throat there. Anyways, that's pretty much a mirror for the Fire Moon, which is defined by its death and meteor childbirthing. We're going to start with Elia's death, which is fairly horrible, of course, so fair warning. As we know... Elia was horrifically raped and killed by Sir Gregor Clegane during the sack of King's Landing. Gregor is called the Mountain That Rides, and his helm bears a stone fist on its crest. A comet or meteor can surely be thought of as a flying or riding mountain, and the stone fist gives us the same idea, especially since we've seen fists and hands as depictions of moon meteors and moon-smashing comets. Now, in the fight with Oberyn, Gregor seemed to play the role of the moon and also the moon meteors that come from the moon, but other times we've seen him playing the role of the comet, such as when he puts out Beric Dondarrion's eye. In this case, since he's killing someone who seems to symbolize the fire moon, Elia, his mountain that rides symbolism would seem to be playing the role of the comet that rides. He's also acting at Lord Tywin's command, just as the Azor Ahai myth has the comet as the sword held by the Sun King. Tywin is wielding Gregor against Elia, in other words, like the sun wielding the comet against the fire moon. In fact, when Danny discusses her vision of Rhaegar and Elia in the House of the Undying with Jorah, Jorah refers to the murders of Elia and her children as having been done simply by the Lannisters. She noted, there was a woman in a bed with a babe at her breast. My brother said the babe was the prince that was promised and told her to name him Aegon. Prince Aegon was Rhaegar's heir by Elia of Dawn, Sir Jorah said, but if he was this prince that was promised, the promise was broken along with his skull when the Lannisters dashed his head against the wall. I remember... Danny said sadly, they murdered Rhaegar's daughter as well, the little princess Rhaenys she was named, like Aegon's sister. There was no Visenya, but he said the dragon has three heads. What is the song of ice and fire? An apt question there at the end. It's the question that we're answering today, at least from one angle. The title of the series has many layers of meaning, of course, but John is the closest thing to the human personification of the Song of Ice and Fire. Setting that aside, you can see that since Amory Lorch and Gregor were acting at the behest of Tywin, quote, the Lannisters did indeed murder Elia, and in terms of symbolism, that equates to the sun killing the fire moon. Another detailed correlation with Elia's death and the death of the second moon is the fact that Elia died in the Red Keep. The Red Keep is the symbol of the sun in King's Landing, so Elia dying in the Red Keep is entirely consistent with the second moon wandering too close to the sun at its time of death. Even better, the reason Elia was in the Red Keep is because Ares was essentially holding her hostage. Jamie says in A Storm of Swords that the king reminded Lewin Martell gracelessly that he held Elia and sent him to take command of the 10,000 Dornishmen coming up the king's road. Elia, the Fire Moon, is literally a prisoner of one Sun King when she is murdered by another, with Tywin as the other symbolic Solar King figure, of course. Elia's children are dead, supposedly, which would be a match for the idea of the black meteors representing dead things, as we saw with dead lizard baby Rago, or even Ashara Dane's stillbirth. The symbolism continues onto young Griff, a.k.a. Fagon Blackfire, who claims to be Elia's son, but seems more likely to be of Blackfire descent. We've spoken previously about the Blackfire sigil, and the sword of Blackfire, and how they're great symbols of the Black Moon meteors, and in general terms, the Black Dragon itself, 
pretty much is the prime symbol for Azor High Reborn. Many also think that the stone beast breathing shadow fire in Danny's House of the Undying Vision might represent Fagon Blackfire, with the thinking being that Blackfire might be the same thing as shadow fire. Right away, it's easy to see how a stone beast breathing shadow fire could serve as a great description of the black meteor dragons which brought the darkness. The resurrection aspect of Azor Ahai Reborn is present in Fagon's symbolism as well, because the idea of Fagon being the real Aegon VI Targaryen, Rhaegar's son, would be akin to him returning from the dead. Tyrion expresses this idea when he sort of mockingly paraphrases what Fagon might say to Daenerys when he meets her. Good morrow to you, Auntie. I am your nephew, Aegon, returned from the dead. I've been hiding on a pole boat all my life, but now I've washed the blue dye from my hair, and I'd like a dragon, please. And oh, did I mention my claim to the Iron Throne is stronger than your own? There's even a hint about Fagon Blackfire, the Blackfire Moon dragon, being lodged in the ice here. Buying into the tale that he really is Elia's son Aegon for a moment, he would have been cast away from the Red Keep at the time of his Fire Moon mother's death, and when we see him, he has disguised himself by dyeing his hair blue and wearing blue. And that's kind of like him getting frozen. So that's Elia of Dorne. May she rest in peace. She fits the Fire Moon pretty well. The one exception which I do want to acknowledge is that she doesn't seem to have the fiery personality as Queen Rhaenys did, and Elia and Rhaegar's relationship was not the passionate one, which is just the opposite of Rhaenys and Aegon, who did have the passionate relationship. Now, the rest of the symbolism is strong enough to make things clear, I think, so it's okay if this one thing was flip-flopped, in my opinion. It's easy to see that Rhaegar and Lyanna's relationship is likely to turn out to be the passionate one for reasons of plot, and of course the plot and character-driven narratives always come first. I would and do make the case that George has given us enough strong symbolism around Elia and Lyanna to easily identify them, however. And just before we move on, let me slip in an aside regarding the Targaryen family tree. I am primarily looking at this from the RLJ perspective, with Rhaegar as the solar king, with two lunar wives of ice and fire, who conceives John with his ice moon queen, Lyanna. But if we want to include Daenerys, we can actually do so by considering Ares and Rhaella the original solar king and fire moon queen. Danny and Rhaegar, as their children, would then be equivalent to black fire moon meteors, hurling outward from the fire moon explosion. And you'll recall that Danny was born during one of the worst storms in Westerosi history, while Rhaegar was born on the day that Summerhall burned, both of which match the idea of a fiery moon explosion for a cradle. Rhaegar, however, unlike Danny, is the black moon meteor that goes on to impregnate the ice moon, which would be Lyanna. So in this schema, Danny is the fiery version of Azor High Reborn, child of the fire moon queen Rhaella. And John is the frozen version of Azor High Reborn, child of the Ice Moon Queen, Lyanna. Both ways of looking at the family tree work, and of course, these patterns tend to repeat endlessly, with John going on to play the Solar King role and having two symbolic lunar wives of his own, as we saw last time. But I just wanted to point out this other way of thinking about it, since it includes Danny, and nicely pegs John and Danny as the Ice and Fire Moon Meteor Children, with Danny paralleling the fire dragons and John paralleling the others. Hot and cold versions of Azor High Reborn. It seems like an intuitive way to think about them anyways, even without all this specific analysis, and that's how I have long viewed them. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Let's talk about Lyanna Stark. A storm of rose petals blue. This section is brought to you by the Patreon in support of the Mystery Knight, known only as Rusted Revolver, the Lilith Walker, Great Dane Friend, and Earthly Avatar of Heavenly House Pisces, and Sir Dionysus of House Galadon, wielder of the Milk Glass Blade, the Just Maid, Earthly Avatar of Heavenly House Virgo and Libra. Turning our attention to Lyanna Stark, she of the Blue Winter Rose we can observe that she has two important scenes, the tourney at Hall in the year of the fall spring, and, of course, her death scene at the Tower of Joy. The Hall tourney is kind of a two-parter, 
consisting of the events of the tourney itself, centering around Rhaegar and Lyanna, as well as the Night of the Laughing Trees story, since Lyanna was almost certainly the Weirwood Sigil mystery knight, known as the Night of the Laughing Tree. We'll deal with the Night of the Laughing Tree story another time when we talk about the Weirwood side of ice magic, so right now let's begin our mythical astronomy ode to Lyanna Stark by quoting the summary of the Harrenhal tourney from the World of Ice and Fire. And when the triumphant prince of Dragonstone, named Lyanna Stark, daughter of the Lord of Winterfell, the queen of love and beauty, placing a garland of blue roses in her lap with the tip of his lance, the Lickspittal lords gathered around the king, declared that further proof of his perfidy. Why would the prince have thus given insult to his own wife? the Princess Elia Martell of Dawn, who was present, unless it was to help him gain the Iron Throne. The crowning of the Stark girl, who was, by all reports, a wild and boyish young thing, with none of the Princess Elia's delicate beauty, could only have been meant to win the allegiance of Winterfell to Prince Rhaegar's cause, Simeon Staunton suggested to the king. Rhaegar is the dark solar king here, and his black lance, penetrating the blue rose garland, is symbolic of, well, you know. It's not just a dick joke, though. The black lance here represents the seed of the sun king, and in the sky, that is the black meteor hurling towards the ice moon. Lyanna's garland is called a crown of blue roses, and this event is called the crowning of Lyanna, so I think her blue rose crown must equate to the lunar halo the nimbus of light which seems to surround the moon, just as the points of the golden king's crown represent the sun's rays. The circle of the garland is penetrated by the tip of the black lance. And again, it's not just a sex symbol, it's the impregnation of the ice moon by a black meteor. Rhaegar then lays the rose crown in her lap with the lance, implying more penetration. Recall again the sigil of House Florent, a red fox enclosed within a circle of twelve blue flowers. The red fox would be equivalent to Rhaegar's black lance, becoming locked in the ice moon symbol of the ring of blue flowers. Now, one of our Patreon high priests of starry wisdom, Archmaester Emma, founder of the Maiden Maesters and keeper of the two-headed sphinx, had a good find here. Ned recalls the tourney of Harrenhal as the moment when all the smiles died when he thinks of it in A Game of Thrones. Ned remembered the moment when all the smiles died, when Prince Rhaegar Targaryen urged his horse past his own wife, the Dornish Princess Elia Martell, to lay the Queen of Beauty's laurel in Lyanna's lap. He could still see a crown of winter roses, blue as frost. Now recall the dancing scene at Castle Black when the horn blew to signal Val's return. We looked at that last episode. The line there was, Others had heard it too. The music and the laughter died at once. Dancers froze in place, listening. I pointed out this line as a clue about the others being created, frozen in place, in conjunction with a knight's queen figure, Val, and a horn. And Archmaester Emma pointed out that the language about the laughter dying versus the moment when the smiles died is very similar. And of course, both events are tied to Night's Queen figures, Val and Lyanna. And you gotta love that blue as frost description of her crown. Dying laughter and dying smiles also remind us of Euron's blue smiling eye, which we eventually see revealed as gleaming with malice. And more generally, it reminds us of the idea of smiling moon crescents dying. Returning to the summary of Rhaegar and Lyanna from The World of Ice and Fire, the narrative continues with strong parallels to The Long Night. And let me just point out ahead of time that when they talk about the fall spring lasting less than two turns, they mean two turns or cycles of the moon. Two moons. Here's the quote. With that simple garland of pale blue roses, Rhaegar Targaryen had begun the dance that would rip the Seven Kingdoms apart, bringing about his death and a thousand more, and put a welcome new king on the Iron Throne. The false spring of 281 AC lasted less than two turns. 
As the year drew to a close, winter returned with a vengeance. On the last day of the year, snow began to fall upon King's Landing and a crust of ice formed atop the Blackwater Rush. The snowfall continued off and on for the best part of a fortnight, but which time the black water was hard frozen and icicles draped the roofs and gutters of every tower in the city. As cold winds hammered the city, King Ares II turned to his pyromancers, charging them to drive winter off with their magics. Huge green fires burned along the walls of the Red Keep for a moon's turn. Prince Rhaegar was not in the city to observe them, however, nor could he be found in Dragonstone with Prince Elia and their young son Aegon. Not ten leagues from Harrenhal, Rhaegar fell upon Lyanna Stark of Winterfell and carried her off lighting a fire that would consume his house and his kin and all those he loved and half the realm besides. So there's a vicious, vengeful winter that sets in and covers everything in snow, complete with the infamous cold winds hammering the city, right after Rhaegar gives Lyanna her frosty blue crown. That sounds like long night symbolism. It even says that Rhaegar fell upon Lyanna, like a black meteor landing on the ice moon. Naturally, it's during this long night-like time that R plus L sneak off to the Tower of Joy to equal J, if you will. The all-important black ice motif makes an appearance here as the black water rush freezes solid, something which is mentioned twice. I've pointed out before that the black water rush flowing from the god's eye is a wonderful depiction of the waves of night, black water, that flow from the sun-fire-moon conjunction, the god's eye. But now the black water is frozen solid, so it's black ice coming from the god's eye. And as you probably remember, I think the symbol of black ice refers to both Valyrian steel, like Ned's sword, black ice, and dragonglass, which is frozen fire that kind of looks like black ice. And both of those are also black meteor symbols, of course. Thus, Black ice coming from the god's eye during a cold winter is simply talking about black sword-like moon meteors coming from the sun-fire-moon conjunction during the long night, which happens to be our favorite topic. During this cold time, we also have raging fires designed to fight the winter for a moon's turn. The idea of using fire magic to fight the horrible winter definitely seems like an allusion to the long night, and it reminds us of Melisandre lighting night fires at the base of the wall. Taken as a whole, this tale creates a tremendous parallel. The story of Rhaegar making an ice dragon baby with his icy moon maiden Lyanna during this cold, long night-like time mimics the story of Aegon and Visenya creating the White Shadow Kingsguard in the wake of Rhaenys' death during the Years of the Dragon's Wrath, another dark time period which seemed to be a metaphor for the long night. It literally said it was a black time. Now, one of the most heretical ideas I've proposed in this series is that Night's Queen and King lived during the Long Night and not afterwards. So every time we see a symbolic Night's Queen and King hookup that occurs during a Long Night metaphor, I'm going to make a big deal out of it and make sure you notice. I don't toss out the accepted canon at the drop of a hat, after all. Every time I do so, I try to show that there is a mountain of evidence steering us in that direction. This paragraph takes special care to say that, as cold winds hammered the city, Rhaegar was absconding with his ice moon bride and conceiving John the ice dragon baby. Now at this point, if you listen to all of my podcasts and you have a sharp memory, you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, LML, in one of the Bloodstone Compendium episodes, I think you told us that Lyanna's death in the tower represents Nissa Nissa's death and the forging of Lightbringer, but now you're telling us that she's the ice moon? What gives, LML? Anyways, yes, that is what I'm saying. The picture I'm seeing is this. Both moons share certain common elements, because they're essentially like sisters, like Rainies and Visenya. But they have subtle variations, which always reflect the difference between ice and fire. Think of the Solar King forging a Lightbringer with each moon queen. I think that's what we're being shown. The Nissa Nissa moon impregnation process is repeated with each moon each moon maiden. For example, 
when and if the ice moon gets impregnated with a comet in the winds of winter, I'd expect it to mimic the god's eye eclipse alignment of the past as it gives birth to a fresh batch of meteor dragons. The moons and moon maidens have a lot of parallel symbolism, in other words, just as ice and fire do. For example, since we're talking about blue roses, let's consider the flower symbolism of the two moons. In one of those old Bloodstone Compendium episodes, we examined the idea of flowers being associated with the moon. The fire moon, I guess we can call it now. We talked about the heliotropium flower connection, which was pretty cool if you remember. One type of heliotropium plant is called the valerian, and it's known for its purple flowers. You may have caught your phone autocorrecting to the valerian with an E when you were really trying to talk about dragon lords, if you are the type of person who types into their phones about dragon lords as I am. Essentially, this is a clue about the origins of the Valerians being rooted in the Bloodstone Emperor and the Amethyst Empress. The Amethyst Empress looks like a Valerian, according to Danny's dream vision, with amethyst eyes and silver hair, while the gem Bloodstone is also called Heliotrope, a name shared by a purple flowering Heliotropian plant, which is also called a Valerian. At this point, I think it's safe to say that George never chooses a name without intention. We've also seen that he does indeed use the flower theme as a metaphor to tie together a couple of moon and moon maiden related concepts, namely flowering as a euphemism for a woman getting her first moon blood, and the fire moon's explosion can be symbolized as a tide of fiery moon blood, a bloody flowering of the moon. But the ice moon has flower symbolism too, those blue as frost winter roses. They make for a great full moon symbol when in the form of a crown, but they're used in a slightly different way in the famous Ned Dream recall of the Tower of Joy scene, which, not coincidentally, is Leanna's biggest scene and the next thing we need to talk about anyway. This iconic passage is from A Game of Thrones. And now it begins, said Sir Arthur Dane, the sword of the morning. He unsheathed dawn and held it with both hands. The blade was pale as milk glass, alive with light, no said Ned, with sadness in his voice. Now it ends. As they came together in a rush of steel and shadow, he could hear Lyanna screaming, Eddard, she called, a storm of rose petals blew across a blood-streaked sky, as blue as the eyes of death. The blue eyes of death are pretty clearly a reference to the eyes of the others, who are the meteor children of the ice moon, according to our hypothesis. The blue eyes of the others, in particular, are called blue stars. So these blue rose petals that blew across the blood-streaked sky, looking like the eyes of the others, would therefore seem to be a representation of ice moon meteors in the sky during the long night, a time when the sky was full of moon blood. The blue star eyes of death, streaking through the sky as the ice moon maiden gives birth. It's poetic mythical astronomy. This is a really strong symbol. And look, I know that people listen to and read mythical astronomy with varying degrees of skepticism. Some people think I'm more or less barking up the right tree on most things, while others buy the main moon meteor long night theory, but might not be too sure about much else. And then there are even a few people who probably disbelieve most of what I posit, but listen anyway, because they enjoy the presentation, or because they need something to disagree with, or maybe they dislike the sound of my reading voice, who knows. And certainly... I often point out little symbolic patterns, which may or may not be intentional, realizing full well that some of them are bound to just be coincidence. But sometimes, sometimes we get these doses of really, really clear symbolism, and I like to imagine people on the fence about the given hypothesis going, okay, I see it now. LML is right. She is a damn moon maiden, and those blue roses in the sky are some damn moon meteors. You don't have to cuss, but I hope you're enjoying this entirely new look at the Tower of Joy, one of the most famous scenes in the backstory of A Song of Ice and Fire. And I hope you're getting the full punch of these sort of banner scenes for mythical astronomy. Frequently, we find this kind of A-plus astronomy metaphor attached to these sort of odd yet poetic lines that really stand out in the narrative. I mean, it's easy to understand why Martin would place blue rose petals in the sky in Ned's dream recall version of the Tower of Joy, but why does he describe them as blue as the eyes of death, a phrase which unambiguously calls out to the blue star eyes of the others? In this case, 
it would appear that the answer can only be fully understood by understanding the mythical astronomy. Leanna is an icy moon maiden, and by placing her blue rose petals in the sky outside her tower and then comparing them to the blue star eyes of the others, the author has effectively labeled the roses as blue stars, falling blue stars, coming from the pregnant moon maiden at the top of the tower. Spectacularly, this same image is also telling us that the others originate from icy moon maidens, which is a hint about the primary origin of the others being rooted in the Night's Queen story. Now, speaking of the others, they aren't just staring at us through Leanna's flying rose petals. They're also standing guard outside the Tower of Joy. As we've seen, those Kingsguard with their snow-white, moon-pale, ghostly armor can be used to represent White Walkers. I hope I've established that by now. We can imagine these three Kingsguard coming out of the tower to meet Ned and his crew like Ice Moon meteors coming from the Ice Moon when it's impregnated with the seed of the Black Dragon, just as the blue roses like the eyes of the others come out of the tower when Leanna is pregnant and giving birth. Dawn is an Ice Moon meteor symbol too, and of course Ned takes Dawn from the Tower of Joy and returns it to Starfall like an Ice Moon souvenir. Ned is actually confirming the origins of the Dawn Meteor for us, I think. It came from the Ice Moon. We could interpret Ned carrying Dawn to Starfall as the Dawn Meteor falling from the Ice Moon and landing at Starfall, just as the legend suggests. Or it could be that the Tower of Joy also serves as the landing site. The Heart of Winter is the other place I think the Dawn Meteor might have landed, and it's also an Ice Moon symbol just like the Tower of Joy. Ned taking the sword from a dead Arthur might be symbolic of making a sword from a pale stone meteorite, after which it might have been taken to Starfall. Leanna's bones are also ice moon meteor symbols. The white bones of an ice moon maiden would symbolize pieces of the ice moon, certainly, and they too are taken from the scene by Ned. The three sigils of the former houses of those three Kingsguard actually seem to tell the story. Now, this is one of those patterns which... May or may not be coincidence, but I'm going to go ahead and point it out to you because it would fit with everything else going on in this scene. And Martin really does love to use people's sigils to enhance the symbolism of a given scene. So here it goes. The sigil of House Went is a black bat on yellow, and they're from Heron Hall, which is a prime fire moon symbol. But here, the black bat plays the fire moon meteor dragon locked in ice roll, as it says, Across his white enameled helm, the black bat of his house spread its wings. The black bat is locked in ice, in other words. Then we have the white tower crowned with flame on a smoke-gray field, sigil of House Hightower, the former house of the white bull, Gerald Hightower. The burning white tower can symbolize a burning white sword or a burning white tree or a burning white moon. And since Gerald is the white bull, and white bulls are usually lunar symbols, I'm inclined to say that this is showing us one of the moons on fire in this instance. Then we have the white falling star and the white sword of the Dane sigil, showing us the ice moon meteor falling to earth. Black bat on white shows us the black meteor impregnating the ice moon, the high tower sigil shows us a moon on fire, and then the Dane sigil shows us the white meteor coming from the ice moon. I mean, perhaps, you know? I can't help but try to make a sequence out of them, as these are all the right ingredients to tell the symbolic story of exactly what is happening here with John's birth. Even if it isn't a specific sequence, again, these are the right symbols to explain the meaning of the metaphor of R plus L equals J. White swords and white shooting stars burning white towers on a smoke-gray field, and a great dragon locked in ice symbol with the black bat on white. To sum up, here at this most famous of locations, we have three kings guard whose symbolism seems to tell the story of the impregnation of the ice moon. We have four excellent symbols of ice moon meteors, the blue death-size roses in the sky, the king's guard, dawn, and the bones of Leanna, and they're all gathered at the Tower of Joy and then dispersed. And this entire event was set off by John's conception. A dragon locked in ice. This section is brought to you by three members of the Sacred Order of the Black Hand. Matthias Mormont, the sea goat of the bottomless depths. Count Magpie the Rude of the Shivering Hot Screen, Hornblower of the Oslofjord. 
and the one and only Viseria Sunbreaker. The symbol of the seed is key here, because seeds are the catalysts for our various types of chain reactions, be they in the sky with heavenly bodies or on the ground with flesh and blood people. Meteors and comets can be thought of as star seeds, and when the original comet hits the fire moon, that's the sun's seed impregnating the moon. This is the first alchemical wedding, if you will, and it results in the moon giving birth to baby dragon meteors. Those are in turn new star seeds or dragon seeds, however, and while some of them impregnate the earth, one seems to have impregnated the ice moon, as we've been talking about. Now, because these black meteors are hurling outward from the sun-darkening explosion of the fire moon, we can regard them as the star seeds of the Dark Solar King, and that is the Ice Dragon formula. The Dark Solar King gives his seed to the Ice Moon Queen to make Ice Dragon children. This is the second alchemical wedding, the marriage of ice and fire. When Rhaegar puts on his black armor and gives Lyanna the Blue Rose Crown at the Harrenhal tourney, This is the Dark Solar King signaling his intent to place his dragon seed in the womb of the Icy Moon Queen, Lyanna. When Rhaegar literally impregnates her, when Jon is conceived, this represents the black dragon seed being locked in ice. That's why pregnant Lyanna in the Tower of Joy is surrounded by Kingsguard, who are standing in for the others. It illustrates Jon, the dragon seed, being surrounded by ice. But, as I've painstakingly demonstrated over the course of the last few episodes, Night's King and Night's Queen creating the others is a parallel act to Rhaegar and Lyanna conceiving Jon. If Jon is the seed of the dark sun planted in the ice moon, then the others are like the bits of the ice moon that would have been chipped off. That's how we originally identify the others, after all, as icy meteor children of an ice moon figure, Night's Queen. Jon is kind of like the seed that's still in the cold womb, That's why he spent five books freezing his ass off at the wall, preparing himself and training, while the others, on the other hand, have basically already come out of the lunar womb and become cold falling stars. And for what it's worth, when John is resurrected and reborn, I expect him to come out looking a lot more like a white walker. Probably white hair to begin with, maybe red eyes instead of blue. And I think that was hinted at when John emerged from one of the Winterfell tombs covered in flour as a, quote, pale spirit moaning for blood to prank the younger Stark siblings. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Let's just stick with John as the seed in the icy womb for now, because that's his dominant symbolism up to this point in the story. Although, again, I expect that will change after he is resurrected. So, I'm about to show you all the ways in which John is depicted as this dragon seed locked in ice, or the crow in the snow, you can say, if you prefer. But consider this first. The dragon seed meteor becoming locked in the ice moon is what creates the ice moon meteors, which are analogous to the others. Similarly, it's the impregnation of the icy moon woman we like to call Night's Queen that brings forth the others, according to my theory. And again, this is why we find Kingsguard directed to guard the Tower of Joy while Leanne is pregnant with John, and also why we see the blue roses in the sky that look like the eyes of the others. But haven't we all been wondering why the others have begun to stir after all these centuries and even millennia of seeming inactivity? I think the answer is actually right here at the Tower of Joy. It was John's conception. What awakened the others in the recent past is one of the great riddles in the A Song of Ice and Fire fandom, and one which I've never really had a strong guess about. But if John's conception is symbolically analogous to the conception of the others, as I'm proposing, then perhaps it was the actual birth of Jon Snow, the magical ice dragon baby, which was the omen that told the others that the end was nigh, and they better get moving. This idea fits well with fan theories about the others having an equivalent to the prince that was promised prophecy, but of course, from their perspective... It would be more like a prophecy of doom about this monstrous last hero fellow who's bent on their extinction. Hard to know if they have an actual prophecy or not, but I think you grasp the basic idea. If John is destined to confront the others, perhaps the others sense that and have stirred to life to meet their foe. It really would be the best possible match to the mythical astronomy events, which have the black meteor's impact with the ice moon as the thing which triggered the birth of the ice moon meteors, which parallel the others. Now, you could look at this thing a lot more simply and just take the appearance of the blue roses that look like the eyes of the others at John's birth as a sign that his birth has awakened the others. 
even without all my detailed, fancy-schmancy mythical astronomy stuff. It's kind of implied right there. So in regards to this symbolic formula, which creates both the others and Jon Snow, the big mystery here is, what does it mean for the story? Why is there this weird, uncomfortable parallel? I mean, both Jon and the others are children of an icy moon queen, and I've called both ice dragons, but unlike the white shadow others, Jon is heavily associated with the color black, of course. He famously tells Rob that black was always my color when he's leaving for the wall, and obviously he joins the Night's Watch and dresses in black from head to heel in basically every scene that we see him in, unless he's naked in a cave. Yet, like the others, he's definitely associated with cold things. His name is Snow, his nickname is Lord Snow, he plays the King of Winter Roll symbolically and will probably be named to that title in actuality, and he dreams of being armored in black ice while defending the wall. Let's consider that last point a moment. Armored in ice sounds a lot like the others who essentially have ice everything, including their armor and swords. In fact, in A Storm of Swords, Daenerys dreams of torching her foes from Dragonback, and her foes are strangely wearing ice armor as well. And pretty much everyone has taken this as a foreshadowing of Danny fighting the others with her dragons, presumably near the end of the story, and I would agree. So let's check it out. That night, she dreamt that she was Rhaegar, riding to the trident, but she was mounted on a dragon, not a horse. When she saw the usurper's rebel host across the river, they were armored all in ice, but she bathed them in dragon fire, and they melted away like dew and turned the trident into a torrent. It seems simple enough to interpret the possibility that this dream is revealing in regards to the primary narrative here. Danny's Battle of the Trident will be her fighting the others with her dragons. What's interesting to note is that the other-like ice warriors melt and turn a river into a torrent. This calls to mind the river Torrentine, which flows out to sea at Starfall. Now, the real others melt when stabbed with dragon glass, including their milk glass bones. So if these ice-armored warriors in Danny's dream are supposed to be the others, we'd have melting milk glass bones creating a Torrentine river the kind of river that flows by a castle that is home to a milk glass sword. Now, setting that aside, and that's another one of those maybe it's coincidence, maybe not things that I just like to point out in case it is a case of great wordplay. The main point here, of course, is the identical armored in ice language, which is applied to both John and Danny's foes, which clearly seem meant to represent the others. As you can see, John and the others are both ice armored children of ice moon queens, who are yet opposite in color. And, of course, John is rather famously dedicated to fighting the others. John is kind of like the good other, or the black other, basically. So now we're going to do that thing where, having proposed a somewhat abstract concept based on flying space rocks, which I claim relates to the characters in the story, I will now provide examples of beautifully written metaphorical passages from A Song of Ice and Fire, which demonstrate the hypothesis in action. You know how that goes. Now, I've said a few times that every single ice moon symbol, be it person, place, or thing, has some sort of symbolic depiction of the dragon locked in ice. But since this is the RLJ essay, and John is what this pattern is all about, we're just going to go ahead and stick with John-related dragon locked in ice examples for now, because there's plenty of them. From here on out in the Moons of Ice and Fire series, we'll essentially be tracking this symbolism as we visit all of the various ice moon places, persons, and objects. As I began to mention last time, the pattern of John being locked in ice begins as soon as the story begins, with Robert making his cryptic remark, see what I did there, about kings under the snow, Ned, which everyone interprets as a clue about John Snow being a king under the snow. But of course, John would be a dragon king under the snow, a dragon locked in ice. Then a Game of Thrones doesn't go more than a couple of chapters before John's fate of being sent to the wall is sealed, and Bran sees this represented by the line about John sleeping alone in a cold bed, his skin growing pale and hard as the memory of all warmth fled from him. As a matter of fact, almost all of John's examples of locked in ice symbolism revolve around the wall, which is, conveniently, one of the most important symbols of the ice moon. That means that when Bran sees John sleeping at the wall and losing the memory of warmth, that's John sleeping in the ice moon, basically. 
So, too, for all the foreshadowing of John's body being stored in the ice cells of the wall, which we mentioned last time. That's John sleeping inside an ice moon symbol, awaiting resurrection and rebirth. That's exactly how we should think about that black fire moon meteor. It's still trapped up there in the ice moon, waiting for a stray comet to come along and spring it loose. I would love to see the comet return when John is resurrected, and if it does return, I'd expect that's when it'll happen, but that's a tale for another day. Castle Black is much the same symbol. It's a black stone castle, sort of halfway embedded in the ice of the wall. In fact, check out this quote from Dywen about Bowen Marsh's plan to seal up the passages through the wall at Castle Black and elsewhere from A Dance with Dragons. And wildlings and darker things, said Marsh, I would not send out hunters, my lord, I would not. No, you would close our gates forever and seal them up with stone and ice. Half of Castle Black agreed with the Lord Steward's views he knew. The other half heaped scorn on them. Seal our gates and plant our fat black asses on the wall, aye, and the free folk will come swarming o'er the bridge of skulls or through some gate you thought you'd sealed five hundred years ago, the old forester Dywin had declared loudly over supper. Two nights passed. We don't have the men to watch a hundred leagues a wall. Torment giant's button, the bloody weeper knows it too. Ever see a duck frozen in a pond with his feet in the ice? It works the same for crows. That's pretty tasty, as it gives us that frozen pond motif again, which seems tied to the others. And I've been saying that the dragon locked in ice can also be thought of as a crow in the snow, since John is also a black crow. And here we have that spelled out exactly, a crow locked in the ice of a frozen pond. To be honest, I only found this coat at the last minute, long after I had started saying crow in the snow. So there you go. The tunnels bored through the rock beneath the wall are called the wormways, which kind of suggests the idea of fireworms, who are cousins to dragons, tunneling beneath the wall, and that's pretty terrific. One of my favorite tinfoil theories is that there is either a greasy blackstone foundation or a fused blackstone foundation beneath the wall, beneath all that ice, which would fit the pattern if true. And of course, that black stone would have gotten there from the dragon lords associated with the Zorahai who came to Westeros, if indeed that turned out to be the case. All right, let's get to the really important stuff. The scenes with John at the wall, which serve as detailed metaphors of John's conception. Now, I've visited these scenes before for different reasons, so forgive me if I sound like I'm repeating myself, but I think, you know, I wouldn't be going back to these scenes unless we had new conclusions to draw, and that is indeed the case. Every single dragon-locked in ice metaphor represents John's conception, but the ones with John at the wall are the best and most explicit. The important thing to keep in mind is that the wall represents the ice moon, just as Leanna does, and so the wall also stands in for Leanna herself. We're going to see things embedded in the wall, which represent both little baby sperm John in Leanna's womb, and also the black meteor getting lodged in the ice, because that's how this works. All right, so famously, during her House of the Undying Vision, Daenerys sees a vision which is generally taken to represent John. A blue flower grew from a chink in a wall of ice and filled the air with sweetness. That blue rose would seem to represent John as a piece of Leanna's legacy blooming at the wall, since the blue winter rose is primarily Leanna's symbol. The thing to notice is its placement in the chink, meaning crack, in the wall, because in A Dance with Dragons, we see another of John's symbols in the same place, in the cracks of the wall. This time it's a detailed depiction of the sun's fire being frozen, and about how this signals the time to prepare for the invasion of the others. John Snow turned away. The last light of the sun had begun to fade. He watched the cracks along the wall go from red to grey to black, from streaks of fire to rivers of black ice. Down below, Lady Melisandre would be lighting her night fire and chanting, Lord of Light, defend us for the night is dark and full of terrors. Winter is coming, John said at last breaking the awkward silence, and with it, the White Walkers. The wall is where we stop them. The wall was made to stop them, but the wall must be manned. 
The light of the setting sun reflects like red fire on the melt water in the cracks of the wall, but as the last light of the sun fades, as the sun dies, if you will, those streaks of red fire transform into rivers of black ice. That's the sun king turning dark, i.e. setting, and impregnating the ice moon symbol, the wall, with his red fire that quenches to black ice, just like a burning meteor that freezes to cold black stone. This is like the freezing of fire, essentially, the tempering of a fiery meteor sword in the heart of the ice moon. This scene draws very strong parallels to the passage we read earlier about Rhaegar giving his seed to Lyanna when the black water rush that comes from the god's eye became iced over. That's a literal river of black ice at John's conception to match the apparent rivers of black ice here at this symbolic scene at the wall. In other words, Martin is using the same black ice river symbol around John's real conception and a scene that symbolizes John's conception. And I don't think that's an accident, but rather a clue that the two scenes are meant to be taken in parallel. Black ice isn't a random symbol either. It's one of John's personal symbols, as we'll see in a moment. In other words, when John sees the dying sun give its red fire to the wall to be turned into black ice, it's kind of like John is walking in on his parents doing it. Funny, but it's kind of true in a symbolic sense. I always like to joke about how the RLJ doubters are waiting for some sort of secret Leanna and Rhaegar sex tape that's never going to come as final evidence for RLJ. But this scene right here might be the closest thing. And what does John say when he sees this? Winter is coming, and with it, the White Walkers. The wall must be manned. This might allude to what I was saying a moment ago. When the Black Dragon is lodged in the ice, the others are coming. When Knight's King gives his seed to Knight's Queen, the others are born. When John is conceived, the others begin to stir. Finishing up with that last quote, take note of Mel's fires burning down below. That's simply another indication of there being fire injected into the wall and into the ice moon. Mel is a fire moon queen, so when she comes to the wall, she's like a piece of fire moon going inside the ice moon, similar to how we interpreted Dark Sister as a fire moon meteor when it was jammed into Aemon's blue star eye. We're going to talk about this a lot more when we cover Sansa, but essentially, this is the female version of the dragon locked in ice symbolism, and that's when a Fire Moon character like Mel or Sansa goes to live inside an Ice Moon symbol. This schema perceives the black meteor coming from the Sun Fire Moon conjunction as a piece of the damaged Fire Moon instead of the seed of the Dark Sun, but it's still the same thing, and it's just a different way of looking at it. For example, Sansa does Fire Moon things at King's Landing, culminating with her helping to turn Solar King Joffrey's solar face dark, but then she turns into a stone, a lane stone, and darkens her hair and clothing, then flies from King's Landing to embed herself in the Eyrie, a supreme Ice Moon symbol. Similarly, Cersei is a Fire Moon character who comes to be imprisoned in the Sept of Baelor, literally locked in an Ice Moon building. Her golden hair is shorn. I think that's probably to demonstrate her fire being quenched. Similar to how Sansa dyes her kissed-by-fire hair a different color and becomes a stone. And Cersei is bald like an egg or a stone. All right, well, a little detour there, but I do like to give you a preview of what's coming down the pipe occasionally. So getting back to John, his emblematic red-fire, black-ice combo appears in one other place... And again, the theme is manning the wall against the others. This is John's famous Azor Hyde dream, of course, which I mentioned a moment ago and many times previously, the one where he mans the wall alone, armored in black ice, with long claw burning red in his fist. You guys probably have this passage memorized by now, so I'll just quote the key lines here. Burning shafts hissed upwards, trailing tongues of fire, scarecrow brothers tumbled down, Black cloaks ablaze, snow, an eagle cried as foemen scuttled up the ice like spiders. John was armoured in black ice, but his blade burned red in his fist. As the dead men reached the top of the wall, he sent them down to die again. Both of these John scenes at the wall with red fire and black ice show us the dragon encased in ice. John's literally encased in black ice armour in this scene, standing on top of the wall as well, while the previous scene shows red fire turning to black ice in the cracks of the wall. 
This scene here is a strong clue that black ice and red fire is a combination with specific relevance to John, and it shows John as a character who is successfully uniting ice and fire. That makes a ton of sense, since John is the product of the second alchemical wedding, the wedding of ice and fire. All right, so continuing with metaphorical depictions of John's conception, using the wall as a stand-in for Leanna, it's time to get freaky. If you're up to date on mythical astronomy essays, you might recall this scene at the wall from A Dance with the Dragons, which indicates John as a black shadow embedded in the ice, and it comes amidst talk of Mel and John creating shadow babies like she did with Stannis. The Lord of Light, in his wisdom, made us male and female, two parts of a greater whole. In our joining there is power, power to make life, power to make light, power to cast shadows. Shadows, the world seemed darker when he said it. Every man who walks the earth casts a shadow on the world. Some are thin and weak, others long and dark. You should look behind you, Lord Snow. The moon has kissed you and etched your shadow upon the ice twenty feet tall. John glanced over his shoulder. The shadow was there, just as she had said, etched in moonlight against the wall. Fans of Radio Westeros will know that there is a lot of foreshadowing that John's temporarily lifeless corpse will be stored in the ice cells, such as when he visits Arnoff Karstark in the ice cells, and it says... Jon Snow could see his own reflection dimly inside the icy walls. And this right after the door to the cells was yanked open by Wick Whittlestick, the first man to stab Jon at the end of a dance with dragons. This etching of Jon's shadow on the ice serves the same purpose, foreshadowing, literally foreshadowing here, Jon's corpse being stored in the ice of the wall. But in mythical astronomy terms, it's also the black dragon meteor lodged in the ice motif. The Shadow Baby talk here provides extra confirmation because we already know that there are many parallels between the Black Shadow Brothers of the Night's Watch and the Black Shadows with Burning Hearts that Melisandre can give birth to. And of course, both of them are black Fire Moon meteor symbols. The world seems darker when they show up, to be sure. The mythical astronomy version of the RLJ formula is spelled out here in two parts. First, Melisandre, a fire moon figure, wants to help John cast black shadows like she did with Stannis, with both John and Stannis playing the dark solar king father role. Let's make some black meteors, she's saying. Then, to show us the black shadow John meteors being lodged in the ice, it says that the moon kissed John and etched his shadow on the wall. John is the Solar King, kissing the Fire Moon and casting a Black Shadow Meteor Child into the Ice Moon, which becomes, say it with me, the dragon locked in ice. John is playing the role of Rhaegar, his father here, but that's okay, because symbolism is fractal and repeats every generation, as we know. A bit earlier in A Dance with Dragons, Mel and Stannis play the casting Black Shadows on the Ice of the Wall game, and this shows the same thing the dark sun, and the fire moon, casting black shadow children into the ice. Rilor was a jealous deity, ever hungry, so the new god devoured the corpse of the old and cast gigantic shadows of Stannis and Melisandre upon the wall, black against the ruddy red reflections on the ice. The real shadows of Mel and Stannis are ultimately the shadow babies, the dark children of Solar King and Fire Moon, once again being projected upon the wall, which stands in for the ice moon. This act, in a way, makes the wall look as though it is on fire. This is a reference to the black fire moon meteor sort of lighting up the ice moon with cold fire, or, shall we say, with fire that is transformed into cold fire. The wall looks like it's on fire, but it's actually not. It's a bit like Stannis's Lightbringer. It looks like it's on fire, but it really isn't, and it gives off no heat. The act of turning fire cold is basically what I've been working my way up to this whole episode, because it's really the most important thing to understand about the creation of the Others and the merging of Night's King and Queen. The freezing of fire is one of the results of the alchemical wedding of the fiery black meteor and the cold icy moon. As such, we'll now have a quick look at two parallel weddings in the north that depict the freezing of fire. 
Not to beat a cold, undead horse here, but these cold weddings will also symbolize John's conception and the creation of the others. The Second Alchemical Wedding This section is sponsored by two of our newest priestesses of starry wisdom, Nyessa, the water nymph, goddess of pain and mercy, and obscured by clouds, the mayor of Walrusville, guest of the Yupik and servant of Bodhi. Marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today. That dream. We've been a dream. Okay, that's enough, guys. Everyone likes the Princess Bride, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about northern weddings that depict a Night's Queen figure getting married and also the freezing of fire. So the first scene like that takes place at the wall, and it does involve John, although the focal point is actually Alice Karstark. This is her wedding to Sigorn, the young Magnar of Then, from A Dance with Dragons. And right from the opening of the chapter, you can see that the cold fire theme is front and center. Relor sang Melisandre, her arms upraised against the falling snow. You are the light in our eyes, the fire in our hearts the heat in our loins. Yours is the sun that warms our days. Yours the stars that guard us in the dark of night. All praise R'hllor, the Lord of Light. The wedding guests answered in ragged chorus before a gust of ice-cold wind blew their words away. Jon Snow raised the hood of his cloak. The snowfall was light today. A thin scattering of flakes dancing in the air, but the wind was blowing from the east along the wall, cold as the breath of the ice dragon in the tales old Nan used to tell. Even Melisandre's fire was shivering. The flames huddled down in the ditch, crackling softly as the red priestess sang. Only ghosts seemed not to feel the chill. Alice Carstark leaned close to John. Snow during a wedding means a cold marriage. My lady mother always said so. The wind is blowing off the wall like the breath of the ice dragon, equating the wall with an ice dragon. Of course, the wall has been directly compared to an ice dragon a couple of times, and both the wall and Vagar, the symbolic ice dragon, seem to represent the ice moon. In any case, the cold lunar breath of the ice dragon makes the flames shiver, and huddle in their ditch as if they had been turned cold. That's pretty much my whole point. The ice moon is what turns fire into cold fire. It's the alchemical reaction chamber and the cold forge, the place where fire is transformed into the cold blue starfire mojo that fuels the others. Shivering flame is a symbolic motif that will turn up many times in the future, and though we don't have time to list them all right now, We have already seen a version of it once when I gave you a sample of the symbolism of the Eerie, where the blue-veined white marble made even the sunlight look chilly. Alice Karstark mentions the idea of a cold marriage, and indeed, she's pretty easy to peg as an ice moon maiden. In fact, John calls her out as such for us. The girl smiled in a way that reminded John so much of his little sister that it almost broke his heart. Let him be scared of me. The snowflakes were melting on her cheeks, but her hair was wrapped in a swirl of lace that Satin had found somewhere, and the snow had begun to collect there, giving her a frosty crown. Her cheeks were flushed and red, and her eyes sparkled. Winter's lady, John squeezed her hand. So there you go, Winter's lady, complete with frosty crown and sparkling eyes. Let's go back to that idea of a cold marriage for a second, because right after Alice tells John that her mother told her that snow during a wedding means a cold marriage, John has a pretty funny line in answer. He glanced at Queen Solis. There must have been a blizzard the day she and Stannis wed. Huddled beneath her ermine mantle and surrounded by her ladies, serving girls and knights, the sovereign queen seemed a frail, pale, shrunken thing. A strained smile was frozen into place on her thin lips, but her eyes brimmed with reverence. This is a great Celise as Ice Queen quote, which I somehow missed last time, 
But the oversight works out rather well because this cold marriage thing is great for us to focus on right now. Recall that snowstorm that assaulted King's Landing and froze the Blackwater Rush that came as Rhaegar and Lyanna conceived John. It serves the same purpose of signifying Lyanna as an ice queen and their marriage as a symbolically cold one, just like Alice and Sigorn's marriage, or just like Stannis and Selyse's marriage. Hopefully this goes without saying, but all of these cold weddings are echoes of Night's King and Night's Queen, the original cold marriage. The Karstark Sigil is a white sunburst, also called a white star by some characters, on a night black field. The white star symbolism is something that makes us think of dawn and the white star in the hilt of the Sword of the Morning constellation, which makes sense for Winter's Lady, if indeed dawn is the dawn of the others, as I've suggested. There's even a possible others play on words as John gives away his cousin in marriage. Who brings this woman to be wed? asked Melisandre. I do, said John. Now comes Alice of House Karstark, a woman grown and flowered of noble blood and birth. He gave her hand one last squeeze and stepped back to join the others. He stepped back to join the others from whence Winter's Lady came. That could be nothing, but it lines up with everything else, so I thought I'd mention the possible wordplay. This is actually the same chapter we looked at last episode where the dancing breaks out with the Night's Watch, Queen Selyse's men, and the wildlings, only to be interrupted by the war horn signaling Val's return, and we got that line, Others had heard it too. The music and the laughter died at once. Dancers froze in place, listening. And then back at the beginning of this chapter, when Mel is leading the prayers before the marriage, it says... Lord of light, protect us, cried Queen Selyse. Other voices echoed the response. Melisandre's faithful, pallid ladies, shivering serving girls, Sir Axel and Sir Narbert and Sir Lambert, men at arms in iron mail and thens in bronze, even a few of John's black brothers. Lord of light, bless your children. Among those other voices, we find clues about the others. Pallid, shivering ladies a Florent with their circle of blue flowers and red fox sigil, and this Sir Lambert fellow, who turns out to be Sir Lambert Whitewater, according to the wiki of Ice and Fire. We've seen the White Knife River frozen over to create an icy White Knife symbol, which would be a reference to Dawn, the original ice of House Stark, according to my thinking, and Sir Lambert Whitewater is later named as one of those dancers who froze in place. Since the others are made of ice, and they're pale white and melt when killed, a frozen dancer made of white water works pretty well as a symbol of an other. And for those of you who know your old cartoons, Lambert the Sheepish Lion is a lion who grew up thinking he was a sheep. I would point out that a solar lion becoming a white sheep would be kind of like a solar king turning into an other, but that would just be completely jumping the shark, and so I'll refrain. Getting back to the wedding ceremony... There's a great sex and sword play line here at the wedding, as it says, The Magnar of Then stood waiting by the fire, clad as if for battle, in fur and leather and bronze scales, a bronze sword at his hip. I don't hardly have to say anything other than, Look, it's the bajillionth instance of weddings and sexual intercourse described in battle language, and that this is, of course, a part of the metaphor of describing meteor and comet impacts as impregnations. Now, when Alice weds Sigorn, they modify the Karstark White Star on Black sigil in a very interesting way. Heldry ended at the wall. The Thens had no family arms, as was customary among the nobles of the Seven Kingdoms, so John told the stewards to improvise. He thought they had done well. The bride's cloak, Sigorn fastened around Lady Alice's shoulders, showed a bronze disc on a field of white wool, surrounded by flames made with wisps of crimson silk. The echo of the Karstark sunburst was there for those who cared to look, but difference to make the arms appropriate for House Then. The white field of the Stark sigil is called an ice-white field, so I think the white field of the new Karstark sigil should probably also be taken as an ice-white field, which seems appropriate for a house now made up of a wildling Magnar and a very old northern bloodline. So I think what we have here is a bronze and crimson sun locked in ice. 
That's a good match for Alice the Winter Queen as a stand-in for Night's Queen, and Sigorn the Magnar of Then as a Night's King analog. This is exactly where we should see the dragon locked in ice symbolism, after all. And see it we do. There's another instance of shadows cast onto the ice of the wall going on here, which mirrors the John scenes that we just looked at. And Melisandre said, Let them come forth who would be joined. The flames cast her shadow on the wall behind her, and her ruby gleamed against the paleness of her throat. As I'm sure you all realize, the flames are the sun here, and Mel is the fire moon, and the shadow cast into the ice would be the black meteor headed for the ice moon, just like all the scenes with John. This line actually comes right before Alice is described as Winter's Lady and the ceremony commences. In any case, despite Melisandre speaking of Sigorn and Alice warming each other when the night is dark and cold, and of them being joined by fire, Winter's Lady has a cold marriage, and an ice dragon turns their wedding fire cold, and that's kind of what I'm driving at. In this chapter, there's also two occurrences of Melisandre being asked what she sees in her fires when she searches for Stannis, with her responding, only snow. That eventually becomes an uppercase snow in Mel's own POV chapter, but right now it's telling us that she is literally seeing lowercase snow in her fires. And that's because the ice dragon turned them cold. (laughs) Anyways, uh... This chapter is also the chapter where we are told that the Black Brothers had taken to using the Wormways to get around Castle Black because of how cold it had become, and also the same chapter where Jon visits Cregan Karstark in the ice cells, and he sees his own reflection dimly in the icy walls. And we got the line, Rusted hinges screamed like damned souls when Wick Whittlestick yanked the door wide enough for Jon to slip through. And as I mentioned a moment ago... This is also the chapter where the other dancers of Queen Selyse froze in place at the sound of the horn. In other words, it's one of those chapters with a very strong and clear theme that runs through multiple scenes within the chapter, and that theme is turning fire cold. The first five paragraphs of the chapter, which contain that bit about the ice dragon blowing Melisandre's fiery prayers away, the flames shivering, and Alice's talk of a cold marriage— really sets a tone that carries all the way through to the end of the chapter where the dancers freeze in place. Now, Alice and Sigorn's wedding parallels the wedding of another Ice Queen figure in A Dance with Dragons, and that would be Jane Poole, dressed up as Arya Stark, wedding Ramsay Snow slash Bolton. Even though the moods of these two weddings are entirely opposite, Alice's wedding is liberating while Jane's is kind of an enslavement, They are pretty much the exact same in terms of symbolism. Again, we'll start with the beginning of the chapter, The Prince of Winterfell, this one is called, and again, we can see the theme clearly spelled out right from the jump. The hearth was caked in cold black ash, the room unheated, but for candles, every time a door opened, their flames would sway and shiver. The bride was shivering too. They had dressed her in white lamb's wool, trimmed with lace, Her sleeves and bodice were sewn with fresh water pearls, and on her feet were white doeskin slippers, pretty but not warm. Her face was pale, bloodless, a face carved of ice. Theon Greyjoy thought as he draped a fur-trimmed cloak about her shoulders, a corpse buried in the snow. This is pretty blatant stuff. A face carved of ice. Baby pearls to introduce moon symbolism a corpse queen marrying an evil Azor high figure in Ramsay, and, of course, shivering flames and a shivering bride. The cold black hearth also emphasizes the idea of cold fire. The language about Jane Poole being like a corpse buried in the snow is simply the female version of the Fire Moon meteor locked in ice again, such as with Sansa at the Eyrie, Cersei imprisoned in the Sept of Baelor, or Melisandre when she comes to the Wall, and it's enhanced by the fact that Jane actually catches frostbite after escaping Winterfell. So in addition to being buried in the snow, she's also sinking into the sea of warm milk. There's actually a perfect companion line to this back at Alice Karstark's wedding. As she's waiting for Mel to finish her praying, she asks John, How much longer, Lord Snow, if I'm to be buried beneath this snow, I'd like to die a woman wed. 
So, not just buried under the snow, but married and dead as well, just like Jane Poole, the corpse bride, buried in the snow. Oh, and I should mention that the sigil of House Poole is a blue circle on white, meant to represent a pool, of course, but it also makes for a nice ice moon symbol. And it reminds us of how the other's voices are like the cracking of ice on a winter lake. There's actually a wonderful clue about house pool symbolism being tied to Leanna as Ned wakes up from his fever dream of the Tower of Joy. Right after Leanna screams, Eddard! as the storm of rose petals blows across the sky, the dream continues with Leanna calling Ned's name again. Lord Eddard, Leanna called again. I promise, he whispered. Leia, I promise. Lord Eddard, a man echoed from the dark, groaning. Eddard Stark opened his eyes. Moonlight streamed through the tall windows of the Tower of the Hand. Lord Eddard? A shadow stood over the bed. How, how long? The sheets were tangled, his legs splinted and plastered. A dull throb of pain shot up his side. Six days and seven nights, the voice was Vayon Paul's. In other words, Leanna turned into Vayon Pool, helping confirm Jane Pool as an ice moon maiden. Now, returning to Ramsay and Jane's wedding, we find Theon is playing the same role that John did at Alice's wedding, a sort of half Stark giving away the Ice Queen. I'm not sure exactly what that means yet, but I thought I'd point it out as it's a parallel between the two scenes. And maybe one of you sharp pencils out there can track this pattern further and report back to us. Anyway, Theon even thinks about himself as a Stark at last in this chapter, which is entitled The Ghost in Winterfell, and that's a title that partially applies to Theon. So his quasi-Starkness is definitely played up in this chapter. The wedding itself has some really great stuff, including mythical astronomy Hall of Fame lines like Up Above the Treetops... A crescent moon was floating in a dark sky, half obscured by mist, like an eye peering through a veil of silk. And then there's this gem right here, which follows immediately after Jane says, I do. I take this man, the bride said in a whisper. All around them, lights glimmered through the mists. A hundred candles pale as shrouded stars. Theon stepped back and Ramsay and his bride joined hands. This is our first symbolic depiction of the others being created here at this Night's Queen wedding, but it's coming at us from a distinctly mythical astronomy perspective. When the Night's King and Queen figures join, this is the black meteor striking the ice moon, and the very next sentence after she accepts the marriage, we are told of a hundred pale, shrouded stars. Those pale, other-like stars are followed up by this passage, which also seems to suggest the presence of something that sounds like the others. Once outside the godswood, the cold descended on him like a ravening wolf and caught him in its teeth. He lowered his head into the wind and made it for the great hall, hastening after the long line of candles and torches. Ice crunched beneath his boots and a sudden gust pushed back his hood as if a ghost had plucked him with frozen fingers, hungry to gaze upon his face. Winterfell was full of ghosts for Theon Greyjoy. Ghosts with frozen fingers sure sound like the others. And you'll notice the candles which created the appearance of those pale stars a moment ago are mentioned again here. Now check out this passage where the black ice makes an appearance. A hard white frost gripped Winterfell. The paths were treacherous with black ice and hoarfrost sparkled in the moonlight on the broken panes of the glass gardens. Drifts of dirty snow had piled up against the walls, filling every nook and corner. Some were so high, they hid the doors behind them. Under the snow lay grey ash and cinders, and here and there a blackened beam or a pile of bones adorned with scraps of skin and hair. Broken panes of glass, covered in hoarfrost and sparkling in the moonlight... Kind of sounds like Sir Waymar's sword, covered in white frost and glimmering in the moonlight before it was shattered. More important is the black ice present here at the Night's Queen wedding, just as with the black water rush freezing when Rhaegar absconded with Lyanna, or as with the black ice in the cracks of the wall that symbolized John's conception. More dragon-locked-in-ice symbolism, or we might say fire-buried-in-the-snow symbolism, 
is found here with the ash and cinders, blackened beams and burnt wood, which are buried under the snow. And if we really want to parse the words here, we can observe that a beam can also refer to light, as in a beam of light. So a blackened beam might be the sort of sunbeam that you get from a dark sun, right? The phrase blackened beam also seems apt for the black meteors that drank the fire of the sun and now drink the light in general. And you guys know how I like to call Azor High's hypothetical black meteor sword Dark Lightbringer. There's actually a great Dark Lightbringer clue in this chapter, as a matter of fact. When Theon thinks about Ned and his smoke dark sword ice, using that the long steel shadow of his great sword had always been between them. Since we know that Ned's sword is compared to the comet and is in many ways symbolic of Lightbringer, this is very like Stannis' shadow baby wielding a shadow sword. And of course, both passages refer to the original sword of Azor Ahai, which I am pretty sure we can think of as Dark Lightbringer. And speaking of Ned's sword, there's an even better black ice symbol that makes an appearance in one of Theon's later A Dance with Dragons chapters, and it takes place in the same place as the wedding, in the godswood before the heart tree. This time, it's the cold black pond beneath the heart tree itself that freezes over. A heart tree stood before him, a pale giant with a carved face and leaves like bloody hands. A thin film of ice covered the surface of the pool beneath the weirwood. This is basically the Ouroboros of black ice symbolism, where the head eats the tail. Because Ned cleaning black ice in this black pond is kind of an iconic image. The first time we ever saw Ned at Winterfell, we saw him cleaning black ice in the black pond. And when Bran sees Ned through the eyes of the heart tree in his last A Dance with Dragons chapter, he sees Ned sitting on a rock beside the black pool, cleaning ice. By having the black pond where Ned dips his black ice sword freeze over, Martin is giving us a great clue that we should think of Ned's black ice sword as a part of a larger black ice symbol. And we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. There's a lot more to see and discuss in this chapter. Ramsay even has a wheel of veined cheese, meaning blue-veined cheese, and thus another symbol of the others, like the blue-veined marble at the Erie. But I want to stick with the theme of turning fire cold, so we'll have to come back to this chapter another time. I think it's sufficient to see that at the weddings of these two unmistakable Ice Queen, Night's Queen figures, we have the shivering flames symbolism, appearing with the dragon locked in ice symbolism, and ties to the Starks and Winterfell. These two parallel wedding scenes go nicely with John's scenes at the wall, being representations of the RLJ formula. This is an alchemical wedding of a different sort that we're talking about here, one which transforms fire into cold fire and makes ice burn. And when I say cold fire or burning ice, I'm talking about the mystery of why the others have cold burning blue star eyes and why Martin is so fond of telling us that nothing burns like the cold. You'll recall that at the end of the last episode, I sort of cryptically said that understanding how John is the living incarnation of the Song of Ice and Fire would actually help us understand the nature of the others. And that's what we're about to discuss. Freezing fire, burning cold. This section is brought to you by two more newly christened priestesses of starry wisdom. Jancy Lee, Lady of the Waves, Bear Mama of the Sacred Den, and Lady Shar, Wielder of the Sacred Shard, Ice Priestess of the House of the Unsleeping. The Song of Ice and Fire is more than just ice versus fire. It's more than just dragons and flaming swords against the others. It's not just a conflict, or even just a balance between opposite forces. It's also a song, after all, a harmonization. To that end, I've noticed a cool bit of symmetry in A Song of Ice and Fire while thinking about elemental magic. Sure, we have ice and fire, anyone can see that, but we also have frozen fire, as in dragon glass, and burning ice, the cold burning blue star eyes of the others, and they're both given to us as important symbols in their own right. These ideas, while strange and paradoxical seeming at first, clearly speak of some kind of harmonization of ice and fire. We're going to spend more time on the burning ice idea, so let's quickly discuss frozen fire in the context of everything we've gone over so far. 
The dragon glass knives, which are becoming more valuable by the minute as the story progresses, are known by the Valerian phrase meaning frozen fire, and this is a fairly literal description. Dragon glass is obsidian, of course, and obsidian is cooled magma, literally molten fire that froze and hardened into place under just the right circumstances. Calling obsidian frozen fire is therefore quite apt, but George seems to be using this concept to define its magical properties as well. Obsidian represents a piece of fire magic frozen in place, which is good for making black knives which kill ice demons. Fire consumes and ice preserves, Martin likes to tell us, and it seems that if you use a freezing action to temper fire, you can fix it in place. If fire magic is like a sword without a hilt, the act of freezing fire seems to add the hilt and make it a weapon that anyone can wield against the others. In other words, it takes a red priest and a lot of pain and suffering to be able to wield raw fire magic as Melisandre does, but anyone can use dragonglass to stab white walkers if they're brave enough, like Sam, because dragonglass is a fire weapon that has been stabilized by its harmonization with ice. It also seems like it's a better weapon than raw fire because it contains both an ice and a fire nature. In fact, I wonder if John's Longclaw might be giving us a clue about this. Its blade is made from smoke-dark Valyrian steel, but its hilt is a white wolf's head with red eyes made from a pale stone. The pommel evokes the weirwoods, who share a ghost's coloring and turn to pale stone if they should die, as well as dawn, a magic sword made from a pale stone. I've long thought that Longclaw was showing an ice and fire unity for this reason, although I think it's also implying the idea of a weirwood as a stabilizing pommel for dragon magic. Kind of a similar concept. Said another way, the black blade being swallowed by the white wolf's head shows Azor High being swallowed by the weirwood net and John's spirit being swallowed by his wolf, who resembles a weirwood. So, too, is the black meteor swallowed by the ice moon. Speaking of Valyrian steel, like dragonglass, it also kills ice demons. At least, in the show, we know that's true, and in the books, some characters think that will be the case, and many in the fandom, including myself, expect that they are right. In a sense, you could think of Valyrian steel, and really all swords, as frozen fire, in the sense that they are formed in a molten state, and then cooled and hardened and fixed or frozen into their shape. But there's an even better clue about Valyrian steel in particular being frozen fire in a symbolic sense, and that's Ned's smoke-dark Valyrian steel sword named Ice. Because Ned's ancestor who wielded ice was nicknamed Barth Blacksword, I think it's okay to simply call Ned's very dark gray sword Black, and thus Black Ice. It was forged in dragon fire, but now it's Black Ice. That means it's a frozen black dragon sword, essentially, and another symbol of the harmonization of ice and fire. And again, if both Valyrian steel and dragonglass are black weapons forged in fire that kill the others, it makes sense to think about them both as frozen fire. Hopefully this goes without saying, but when the black moon meteors drink the fire of the sun and then cool to black meteorites, particularly when tempered in the ice of the ice moon, they would also represent frozen fire. Presumably, if I'm right that Azor High forged his sword from a black meteorite, it would also kill others, and thus it's more or less the same as Valyrian steel or dragonglass. They're all black, frozen fire weapons associated with dragons that kill the others. We've already identified black ice as an important symbol to John, a frozen black dragon figure who dreams of being armored in black ice while his sword burns red like Lightbringer. John is a man named Snow who wears black from head to heel. A black snow, in other words, and that's almost the same thing as black ice. He often thinks of his father's sword, black ice, even thinking that ice was the sword he really wanted when Lord Commander Mormont gave him Longclaw. Now, I don't know about you, but when people give me Valyrian steel swords, I'm usually not picky. Anyway, this is one of the reasons I would like to see John get his hands on Oathkeeper. He would give us the black ice man wielding the black ice sword, and that seems just right. The point is... Black ice is a symbol which seems to encompass both John and his father's black sword, ice. And I think it also includes dragonglass, a.k.a. frozen fire. To put it more simply, dragonglass is black, and it looks like ice. And it can be considered frozen due to its frozen fire description. Thus, I tend to see black ice and frozen fire as the same symbol, 
one which refers to obsidian and valerian steel and even frozen black meteors. Comets, in fact, and I've mentioned this before, can also be described as black ice because they are made up of rock and ice and metal, and they're coated in an ultra-black tar called space goo, which is a little bit similar to the char on a barbecue grill. Repeat, comets are literally hunks of black ice and metal that look like flying fiery swords and dragons. Thus, it should come as no surprise that John the Black Ice Dragon is compared to dragon glass many times, such as when Stannis tells John in A Dance with Dragons that... You are the weapon the Lord has given me. I have found you here, as you found the cache of dragon glass beneath the fist, and I mean to make use of you, even as High did not win his war alone. When Stannis talks of making use of John like a piece of frozen fire, he's speaking of making John the Lord of Winterfell, which would make him the rightful owner of Ned's black ice, in a sense. When John considers the offer, it says, He wanted it, John knew. He wanted it as much as he had ever wanted anything. I have always wanted it, he thought guiltily. May the gods forgive me. It was a hunger inside him, sharp as a dragon glass blade. Finally, when John turns down the offer and is elected Lord Commander of the Night's Watch instead, the token which signifies a vote for John is the arrowhead. The line was, The rest was arrowheads, a torrent of arrowheads, a flood of arrowheads, arrowheads enough to drown the last few stones and shells, and all the copper pennies too. These arrowheads aren't dragon glass, but given John's dragon glass symbolism, I think we can read these arrowheads that stand in for a vote for John as symbolizing dragon glass. And thus we have three scenes revolving around John becoming either Lord of Winterfell or Lord Commander of the Watch which equate John with Dragonglass. As the first quote alluded to, John, with the help of Ghost, was the one who found the cache of Dragonglass by the fist of the first men. And as poor Quentin pointed out on our recent live stream, which you can find on our YouTube channel, the cache of Dragonglass was wrapped in a Night's Watch cloak, almost as if it were a watchman made of Dragonglass. That's exactly what John is implied as, a black brother who is like Dragonglass. By the way, you've got to love the meteor shower representation here. A flood of arrowheads. If they are representing the idea of dragonglass arrowheads, and if dragonglass is meant to be seen as black ice, then we actually have rivers of black ice here to signify John's promotion. And that, of course, would be highly appropriate. There's the torrent language again, too. And, of course, John has a lot of sword of the morning symbolism, as we've seen before. A torrent of black ice, however... Almost sounds like Valyrian steel being compared to Dawn as an opposite of Dawn, which again makes a lot of sense. It's actually very similar to this quote from Barristan's A Dance with Dragons chapter about a black dawn, which comes only a page after John's death. He took his last shuddering breath in the bleak black dawn as cold rain hissed from a dark sky to turn the brick streets of the old city into rivers. That was actually the opening of this chapter that comes right after John feels only the cold, which helps to juxtapose John's death with Quentin's death, something that we'll explore another time. We've talked before about how when Barristan sees a red slash on the horizon a moment later denoting the sunrise, he compares it to the blood welling from a deep wound even before the pain is felt. And that's the exact thing that just happened to John a page before when Wick Whittlestick slashed his neck and he didn't feel it, but the blood was welling quickly. Now, as with the torrent of arrowheads quote that we just looked at, the symbolism here applies to John and to the black sword that he represents. Rivers of cold black rain running through the streets are very close to rivers of black ice that we always see when John's conception is metaphorically depicted. And these rivers of cold black rain come down during the black dawn that comes after John's death. Think about it. Dawn the sword is basically described as white Valyrian steel, so a Valyrian steel sword can be thought of as a black dawn. Dawn the white sword is also associated with the original ice of House Stark, according to me, and Valyrian steel is also black ice in a sense. And here in this scene, we see the rivers of cold black rain appearing alongside the black dawn motif. Now to get more specific, I would say that 
instead of just symbolizing John's conception and birth, we're actually talking about John's rebirth here, since he's just died. The Black Dawn motif also suggests a dark day, such as we have during the Long Night, so it would seem that John's death and rebirth will likely be tied to the new Long Night, where he'll need all the frozen fire weapons he can get. Black Dawn swords and black ice dragon glass knives, some Valyrian steel armor would be sweet, etc., etc. You'll also notice the cold black rain in the scene hisses as it falls, adding a serpentine cast to this whole thing to make us think of dragon glass or dragon-like meteors. As I pointed out last time, it's especially notable that Stannis was talking about using John as dragon glass in that previous quote, and then speaks immediately of Azor Ahai fighting his war. Obviously, there's synergy here, as either flaming swords or dragon glass are useful for fighting the others, and John's dream of being armored in black ice also has Oathkeeper burning red. So what we can see from all this is that black ice and frozen fire symbols, in addition to being tied to John, seem to snuggle up with the Zor High and the Night's Watch and the idea of fighting the others. So in summation, John is the dragon locked in ice, and describing him as frozen fire makes a ton of sense. That's the whole deal with the dragon seed being planted in the cold womb. The cold womb freezes the dragon fire. Hence the red streaks of fire turning to black ice in the cracks of the wall, and hence John being encased in black ice armor atop the wall. John is the frozen dragon seed, and frozen fire, black ice, dragon glass, and now this black dawn idea are basically all his personal symbols. Speaking beyond the context of John, the frozen fire symbol is just what it sounds like. It's fire frozen solid. It's a harmonization of fire and ice, which plays on team fire, and it also goes by the name black ice. But before we ever heard of frozen fire, we heard about the burning qualities of ice. And this is from the prologue of A Game of Thrones. It was the cold, Garrett said with iron certainty. I saw men freeze last winter, and the one before, when I was half a boy. Everyone talks about snows 40 foot deep and how the ice wind comes howling out of the north, but the real enemy is the cold. It steals up on you quieter than will, and at first you shiver, and your teeth chatter, and you stamp your feet and dream of mulled wine and nice hot fires. It burns it does nothing burns like the cold nothing burns like the cold indeed this idea is referenced when the first other is cited a few pages later the other halted will saw its eyes blue deeper and bluer than any human eyes a blue that burned like ice they fixed on the longsword, trembling on high, watched the moonlight running cold along the metal for a heartbeat he dared to hope. It's a vain hope, of course, as Sir Waymar falls to the pale blades of the White Walkers, though we can admire his courage for standing against them in the first place. Cold moonlight is always a nice thing to see around the others, at least when you have a theory about a moon with an affinity for ice. But those eyes... They are a blue that burned like ice. We were just told that nothing burns like the cold, and now that phrase takes on new relevance as we stare into the blue eyes of the other along with Will and Waymar. After the others dispatch Waymar and leave, Will climbs down from the tree, only to be confronted with Waymar's whited corpse. And once again, Martin makes the point about the burning cold. The right eye was open. The pupil burned blue. It saw... Three times in one prologue. Let's just say it makes an impression. I'd call it the dominant motif of the entire prologue, as a matter of fact. The next time we see a pair of blue star eyes, well, they burn too. The hooded man lifted his pale moon face, and John slashed at it without hesitation. The sword laid the intruder open to the bone, taking off half his nose and opening a gash, cheek to cheek under those eyes, eyes, eyes like blue stars burning. John knew that face. Othor, he thought, reeling back. Gods, he's dead, he's dead. I saw him dead. Burning blue star eyes, once again, and this time, in a moon face. That would be an ice moon symbol, obviously, and John, the dark solar figure, has used his sword to leave a crack across the face of the moon, if you will. The white is the black brother, formerly known as Othor, which is one letter away from other, 
And indeed, I think he is symbolizing the others as a whole, with his blue star eyes and slashed moon face. That slash would represent the mark the black moon meteor made piercing the ice moon, according to the theory. And of course, John, who can play the dark solar king role, is the right one to deliver that blow. He's like the Night's King, or Rhaegar, with their Ice Moon Queens. Except John's Ice Moon Queen is a white, and he's giving it his sword instead of his sword. John recalls the incident later with this line. He still saw the white in his dreams, dead Othor, with the burning blue eyes and the cold black hands. Burning, once again. Cold, and yet burning. The next occurrence of blue star eyes is when John talks to Gilly in A Clash of Kings, which we quoted last time. Gilly says Craster gives his male sons to the cold gods, the white shadows. Then John asks, what color are their eyes? To which she responds, blue, as bright as blue stars and as cold. So again, they are stars, burning things, but they are cold. Of course, in terms of flame temperature, blue flame is hotter than orange flame. And in terms of stars, blue ones are the second hottest ones after white stars, much hotter than orange or red stars. Martin, however, has imagined blue stars as cold, but it's a burning cold. When he says nothing burns like the cold, he's almost implying that the very coldest things are actually the hottest kind of burn out there. Any way you slice it, blue stars seem to be both very cold and very hot at the same time in A Song of Ice and Fire. The next sighting of whites, or others, comes in Sam's flashbacks to the Fist of the First Men at the beginning of A Storm of Swords. He's remembering the whited snow bear here. The bear was dead, pale and rotting, its fur and skin all sloughed off and half its right arm burned to the bone, yet still it came, only its eyes lived, bright blue, just as John said, they shone like frozen stars. Like starfire, but turned cold. The phrase frozen star even implies a process by which a star's fire is frozen and transformed into cold starfire. This process is important because this is Night's Queen taking the fiery seed and soul of Night's King to make the others, the cold burning star people. This is why I started talking about the others as frozen dragons when I first introduced the theory that Night's King was a blood of the dragon person. As you can see, Martin really seems captivated by this concept of the others having a cold internal fire. Indeed, I would say that the burning cold symbolism is actually what defines the magic that animates the others and the whites. Moving right along, Sam sees a white walker later in this chapter, but its eyes are not described. That's the one that Sam kills with a dragonglass dagger. We can observe, however, that frozen fire seems to beat burning ice unless Burning Ice has more tricks up its sleeve. I, for one, would not want to try to wield Dragonglass against Dawn, especially Dawn burning with some sort of blue or white fire. Anyway, this is also the scene where we get a look at the pale-as-milk-glass bones of the others for what it's worth. Later in A Storm of Swords, Sam confronts the whited corpse of Small Paul, who died fighting the other with Sam earlier. The Burning Ice theme features prominently. Before he could get out his other knife, the steel knife that every brother carried, the white's black hand locked beneath his chins. Paul's fingers were so cold they seemed to burn. They burrowed deep into the soft flesh of Sam's throat. Run, Gilly, run, he wanted to scream, but when he opened his mouth, only a choking sound emerged. His fumbling fingers finally found the dagger, but when he slammed it up into the white's belly, the point skidded off the iron links, and the blade went spinning from Sam's hand. Small Paul's fingers tightened irrexorably and began to twist. He's going to rip my head off, Sam thought in despair. His throat felt frozen, his lungs on fire. He pushed and pulled at the white's wrists to no avail. He kicked Paul between the legs uselessly. The world shrank to two blue stars, a terrible crushing pain and a cold so fierce that his tears froze over his eyes. The whited Paul has hands so cold they seem to burn. Sam's throat is frozen, but his lungs are on fire. And then finally, the world shrinks to Paul's face and those blue star eyes. 
That last bit makes it sound like those blue stars are getting closer to the world. Falling from the sky, in other words. When stars are rapidly getting bigger, that means they're coming towards you, and it's time to panic. There's a matching line from A Game of Thrones during Jon's fight with the moon-faced and undead Othor in Mormont's study that we need to look at. After Jon slashes his moon face and his burning blue star eyes are described, we get this. Dead Othor slammed into him, knocking him off his feet. Jon's breath went out of him as the fallen table caught him between the shoulder blades. The sword, where was the sword? He'd lost the damn sword. When he opened his mouth to scream, the white jammed its black fingers into Jon's mouth. Gagging, he tried to shove it off, but the dead man was too heavy. Its hand forced itself farther down his throat, icy cold choking him. Its face was against his own, filling the world. Frost covers its eyes, sparkling blue. So, very like the whited small Paul, Othor's cold moon face and burning and sparkling frosty blue star eyes are filling the world. Now, there are two ways to interpret these two scenes, with Sam and John confronting whites with expanding faces. It could be the image of pieces of ice moon falling to earth, as I mentioned but it could also be the black meteor's point of view as it is swallowed by the ice moon. Othor's face is pressed against John, creating the idea of a collision, and in this sense, John is simply paralleling the sword that he used to slash Othor's face. Sam, like John, is a black brother, and his experience describes a crushing pain as his body parts begin to freeze. Sam has a moon face on four separate occasions, one of which gives him a red moon face, so I think we can see Sam as a fire moon turned black meteor, very like John. And in fact, all Night's Watch brothers have the symbolism of black shadows and black meteors. Sam's now being crushed by a cold white with cold blue star eyes, which again could read like the last journal entry of the fire moon meteor before getting trapped in the ice. Sam's tears freeze in his eyes, giving him ice eyes, like the statues of the Kings of Winter and a couple Starks and Boltons. The last mention of Blue Star Eyes, that isn't a reference to the Ice Dragon constellation or the Night's Queen, comes when Bran and company are seeking entrance to Blood Raven's cave with cold hands in a dance with dragons. The whites that attack have eyes that glowed like pale blue stars, so it's basically just more of the same. I think we can observe Martin's consistency here. I mean, he's not really known for being a disciplined writer, at least in the sense of meeting deadlines or using outlines, but... He is actually very disciplined about how he describes the others and their eyes. They're very cold, the coldest things around, and yet they burn. Martin has chosen the symbol of the blue star to symbolize this all-important concept of the burning cold, and we see it consistently wherever others and whites and ice dragons and corpse queens are found. The Black Dot This final section is sponsored by Patchface of Modley Wisdom, High Priest of the Church of Starry Wisdom. And by Archmaester Emma, Founder of the Maiden Maesters, Keeper of the Two-Headed Sphinx, and High Priestess of the Church of Starry Wisdom. Now we have arrived at the heart of the matter regarding all the clues about Night's King being a Blood of the Dragon person. His fire was needed to make the burning cold energy that animates the others. The internal cold fire shown in the eyes of the others is reflective of their dragon heritage through the Night's King, who in turn is either linked to Azor Ahai or is himself Azor Ahai. Thus, Azor Ahai's connection to the others may run deeper than the idea of him slaying them with his red sword. He is their daddy, or maybe their granddaddy. We could have turned this whole idea around and simply started with the question, why does the cold associated with the others always burn? Why do they seem to have cold internal fire shining out through their blue star eyes? And now we know the answer to that question. Or at least, we have a good theory to provide the answer to that question. Because the Night's Queen transmuted the fire of the blood of the dragon and created the others. I've mentioned a few times that ice and fire are the yin and yang of the story, and I'm certainly not the first to make that point. And the yin-yang expresses a vital truth here. The white half of the yin-yang, the yang side, contains a black dot, and the black yin side contains a white dot. 
and the point is that everything contains an element of its opposite. The dividing line is also not a straight line, but rather an S-curve, where one side tapers off into the other. This speaks of cycles, meaning that life and death are part of one cycle, as are day and night, or summer and winter. It's pretty easy to see how consistent this is with some of the philosophy that George has used to define a song of ice and fire, and that's because George is an old hippie, and old hippies know what's up with the yin-yang and this sort of thing. Here's what this means for ice and fire. In addition to fire and ice being inverted parallels of one another, like the visual depiction of the yin-yang, we know that fire has a frozen aspect to it when it appears as frozen fire. And we know that ice can have a burning quality, particularly with those blue star eyes of the others and the whites. Frozen fire still plays on team fire, and the burning cold is definitely on team ice, if you'll pardon the sort of overly basic euphemism. The somewhat paradoxical concepts of frozen fire and burning ice are essentially George's creative depiction of this aspect of yin and yang. In A Storm of Swords, the Taoist philosophy of the yin-yang is only thinly disguised as Bran and Mira and Jojen travel the north and the conversation turns deep. Mira says that she both loves and hates the mountains, loving them because they're beautiful, but hating them because they're arduous to climb or go around. But Bran objects to this, saying that it's impossible to both love and hate something. She responds, Why can't it be both? Mira reached up to pinch his nose. Because they're different, he insisted, like night and day or ice and fire. If ice can burn, said Jojen in his solemn voice, then love and hate can mate. As I was saying, it seems we are being encouraged to think of the concept of burning ice as representing a unity of opposites, a mating of love and hate. Jojen could just as easily have said, if fire can be frozen, then love and hate can mate, and it would have made the exact same Taoist point. Martin is showing us that the others, with their consistently burning blue star eyes, have an element of fire inside them. It may be a cold fire, but it burns nonetheless. Do you see what I'm getting at here? The others look like they swallowed some fire and turned it cold, don't they? That's what George has kind of been telling us. They're not just ice, frozen and immobile. Their ice magic is active. It burns like fire. He's telling us that there is a burning aspect to ice, just as fire can be frozen but still retain the magical qualities of fire. I think he does this in part to sort of amp up the power of the ice side of things, to be able to rival the force and power of fire and the fire dragons, and in part because it's just plain old fun and cool. That's why he's been thinking about ice dragons, or perhaps even a whited dragon, and why he's been showing us the others with burning blue star eyes. But of course, I tend to think Martin does things with a lot of intention, and of course, I am suggesting that there is an important reason why the others seem to have a cold internal fire, apart from just being neato. It's because their creator, the Night's King, was the blood of the dragon. Speaking in celestial terms, it's a two-way street. When the fiery meteor interacts with the ice moon, it's a wedding of ice and fire. Fire is frozen, and ice is animated with a burning quality. We can think of that black meteor inside the ice moon as filling it with fire energy, fire energy which the ice moon turns cold just as the cold womb of the Night's Queen transforms the fire of Night's King into the burning cold of the others. It's worth noting that the meteor in the Ice Moon would be the same breed of magical black meteor worshipped by the Bloodstone Emperor, the one which I propose was used to make Azor Ahai's black sword called Lightbringer. That's pretty powerful stuff. You may have noticed this by now, but that black dot on the white half of the yin-yang sure looks an awful lot like a black dragon meteor locked in the ice. And indeed, a black meteor and a white moon would look a lot like the white side of the yin-yang. That's not just a visual correlation, of course, but a thematic one. The black meteor in the ice moon does indeed represent the fire element to the ice side of things. Now, I don't talk about the show that much on my podcast, but people who have watched the show will recognize that the magical ritual that they created to explain the origin of their Night King character who was turned into a blue-eyed white walker king by the act of shoving dragonglass into the heart of a living human, matches the dragon-locked in ice pattern to a T. Knight's king would be the ice moon figure, and the dragonglass would be the black meteor that fills the ice moon with cold fire. 
Of course, the show version of Night King doesn't seem to exist in the same form in the books, or at least may not exist that way, and the show always simplifies issues of magic from the book canon. But since I had this theory long before that episode aired, it definitely caught my eye. I'm not basing my theory here on anything in the show. However, it was too close of a match not to mention it, and at the least, it serves to visually illustrate the principle that I'm proposing. And of course, it is possible that the show got their idea about stabbing people with magic rocks to make White Walkers from something similar in the books that we haven't learned about yet. All right, I'd like to close this episode with a vision of Rhaegar as Night's King. Now, I've implied a couple of times that Night's King must have transformed himself in the process of giving his seed and soul to Night's Queen, and a transformation is also implied in Old Nan's line about Night's King. Night's king was only a man by light of day, but the night was his to rule. Jamie gets a glimpse of Rhaegar's shade in his weirwood stump dream from A Storm of Swords, and it seems that George is using this scene as an opportunity to show us transformed post-death Rhaegar as a frozen dragon Night's King figure. There came two riders on pale horses, men and mounts both armoured. The Destriers emerged from the blackness at a slow walk. They made no sound, Jamie realised, no splashing, no chink of mail, nor clop of hoof. He remembered Eddard Stark, riding the length of Ares' throne, wrapped in silence. Only his eyes had spoken, a lord's eyes, cold and grey and full of judgement. Is it you, Stark? Jamie called. Come ahead, I never feared you living, I do not fear you dead. Brienne touched his arm. There are more. He saw them too. They were armoured all in snow, it seemed to him, and ribbons of mist swirled back from their shoulders. The visors of their helms were closed, but Jamie Lannister did not need to look upon their faces to know them. Five had been his brothers, Oswell Went and John Darry, Lewin Martell, a Prince of Dawn, the White Bull Gerald Hightower, Sir Arthur Dane sword of the morning, and beside them, crowned in mist and grief with his long hair streaming behind him, rode Rhaegar Targaryen, prince of Dragonstone, and rightful heir to the Iron Throne. Prince Rhaegar burned with a cold light, now white, now red, now dark. I left my wife and children in your hands. This is actually the one Kingsguard as others quote I somehow forgot to include in Moons of Ice and Fire 2, Dawn of the Others, but I'm kind of glad I saved it. Not only are the Kingsguard described as pale shades who are armored all in snow, the mist swirling from their shoulders also mimics the others, whom Tormund describes as white mists, saying, how do you fight a mist, crow? Of course, we have the actual Sword of the Morning, Arthur Dane, present, which is nice. And then, to cap it off, we see Rhaegar, burning with a cold light that shifts from white to red to dark. You know what I'm going to say here, right? It's Dark Lightbringer time again. For what it's worth, we might see an echo of this scene if Fagon, the man claiming to be Rhaegar's son, will eventually be seen with the sword Blackfire, as seems likely from certain clues about Illyrio, and if, as I predict... He takes Gerald Darkstar Dane into his Kingsguard after Darkstar, again as I predict, steals Dawn from Starfall. Rhaegar and his cold dark light would parallel Fagon with Blackfire, and Arthur Dane with Dawn would be paralleled by Darkstar with Dawn. Anyways, when Martin talks about dark light or shadow fire, you can be sure this is more yin and yang style harmonization of opposites creativity. Rhaegar's color change from red to white to dark implies a draining of light, a la Melisandre pulling from Stannis' life fires to create the shadow babies, and burning with the cold light is language that really belongs to the others, as we just saw. But then, here is Rhaegar, leading a crowd of white shadows dressed in snow and mist, so I guess it all makes sense. The whole thing about Night's King being a blood-of-the-dragon person is that his fire is transformed into the cold fire of the others, and that's what Rhaegar is showing us in this vision. This is an image of Rhaegar after his death, representing post-transformation Night's King, and now he burns with a cold light which is also turning dark, having just created his army of white shadows with his own life fires. 
And who should stand there facing him? Why, two folks with flaming swords, ones which burn with pale flame and silvery blue flame. Jamie and Brienne both have a certain kind of last hero symbolism, and both were the owners of Oathkeeper, formerly the Black Ice of House Stark. We'll have to unravel this end of the exchange in the dream cave below Casterly Rock another time, of course, but the fact that Night's King Rhaegar and his snowy white shadows are opposed by flaming sword heroes only enhances the War for the Dawn vibe of this scene and helps to confirm our identification of Rhaegar as the Night's King figure in this scene. Now, to preview the next episode, let me point to a question that I've left hanging. You understand why the others represent burning ice, because Night's Queen froze the blood of the dragon to make them. But why does John represent frozen fire? If John and the others come from the same Dark Solar King impregnates the Icy Moon Queen formula, why isn't John's symbolism exactly the same as the others? Why is John instead like an inverted other with black ice armor instead of white? Why do both John and House Stark in general seem to have a connection to the others, yet they're also sworn to oppose them? There's a really, really good answer, and it's going to be our next big mythical astronomy breakthrough discovery, if I do say so myself. Namely, we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty of the founding of House Stark and the identity of the last hero. So get ready for that, and for some new characters from the books that we haven't discussed before. And as I mentioned at the top, we'll be doing our usual live stream Q&A on Saturday, January the 20th at 3.30 Eastern. And you can send in your questions ahead of time for that live stream to get them answered by leaving a comment on YouTube or WordPress or Reddit or Patreon. Or you can send a raven. Or you can contact me via Glass Candle Vision. Or you can send a message to Patchface under the sea. 